Welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where you send in your questions and I find out the answers. Sorry, I'm not trying to be rude. It's just I'm doing an experiment. Now, here's the first question from Cordell. Why do bats sleep upside down? The short answer is because they don't have claws on their head to hang on with. Okay, I don't know why bats sleep upside down when they sleep, but by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to your question and a bunch of other cool stuff about sleep. Why do we yawn when we're sleepy? Nobody knows why we yawn when we're tired, but it's contagious, like a cold, except you don't get sick. Scientists say we yawn just from seeing other people yawn. Here's an experiment you can do with your family or your friends. Just do this. And chances are, people around you will start to yawn without even thinking about it. Nobody knows why we yawn. Nobody knows why we yawn. When we yawn, we breathe in oxygen. Get the old air out and the new air in. If you yawn, someone else will too. But we don't know why it's something we do. Cause nobody knows why we yawn. Nobody knows why we yawn. We can put a man up on the moon. We can skate on ice in the month of June. We can build a robot to mow our lawn. But nobody, nobody knows why we yawn. Oh, sorry, I'm still doing my experiment. Were you watching carefully? Did you? Yawn? It turns out it works on chimps too. So next time you're at the zoo. Gotcha! Gotcha, yeah, it's you. Well, well, well. It seems that chimps are not the only animals that yawn. In fact, most of them do. What happens if you sleep your whole life? Nobody knows, Trevor, because no one slept for their entire life. But there are made-up stories like Rip Van Winkle. He fell asleep for 20 years. But judging by this, if you did sleep your whole life, you'd probably end up looking like Santa Claus, only without the reindeer, red suit, or presents. But in real life, nobody sleeps for 20 years in a row. In the wild, big cats sleep up to 20 hours a day. That's this much. That means they're only awake for four hours a day. Because they sleep a lot, they save their energy and don't have to eat as much. Catching your dinner is tiring work. Next question's from Talea. How much do we sleep? Hmm, I've never really thought about how much we sleep in total, but I know that grown-ups sleep eight hours a night. Okay, let's see here. You do eight hours a night times Seven days a week equals 56 times 52 weeks in a year equals 2,912 times the number of years. Oh my gosh, this is unreal! I can't handle it! Why do I even have a calculator this big? <laughs> You're gonna make my head explode! Here we are at a brain research clinic, the perfect place to come after your head explodes and to find out how much we sleep. And here's Anita, a brain specialist. Hi, Harrison. Hi. So, Anita, how much time do we sleep? Approximately 25 years. 25 years? That's a lot of time wasted sleeping. I could do so many better things like play music all night. Yeah! Play music all night! Play music all night! Well, I'm starting to say, Harrison, that's just impossible. You just can't do it. <laughs> Your body would just fall asleep even if you didn't want to. Shucks! Play music all night! Yeah! Woo! Uh. How come we need sleep? Yeah, why do we need sleep? Anita tells me that it has to do with these guys. Growth hormones. We have to sleep so much because that's when our body produces them. They make kids grow. Sleep is also the time when our body does most of its repair work. 
So, not me, but that's why other kids have to sleep so much, right? Sure. <laughs> what does your body do when you sleep? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, to answer that question, why don't we do a little experiment? Go put on your PJs. PJs? Okay. Destiny, the best way to answer your question is for me to go to sleep. With wires attached to my head. So I'm ready to go to sleep, and these wires are gonna measure my brain activity while I'm asleep. And no, in case you're wondering, I don't sleep with a teddy bear. The answer to what happens to your body when you're asleep is in your brain. So is that a real brain? Yeah, it's a real cow's brain. It's about the size of a 12-year-old's brain. Thanks a lot, now I'm gonna have nightmares. Okay, we're recording. Good night, Harrison. So I went to sleep while a camera watched how I moved. And the wires on my head sent signals to a computer that drew my brain waves. It showed how active my brain was. Then, Anita showed me what happened to my body while I slept. Harrison, this is when you're awake. Okay. As you can see, your brain waves are smaller. Here, my brain waves are small. That shows that I'm still awake. Then the waves get bigger as my body slows down and I go into a light sleep. You can see that your brain activity is starting to change. Yeah, it goes more exactly. jagged there. Yep, the waves are bigger, which means you're starting to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. These are what's called sleep spindles. Okay. So that means you're around stage two, so you're asleep now. Okay. And your breathing is still constant and your muscles are still moving. Scientists measure sleep in five stages. The waves show how I am asleep now, and as the night goes on, my sleep gets deeper. Then, something suddenly changes. All of a sudden, you see really... Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's... A lot of fluctuations up and down. Wow. Big change. Yeah. The fifth stage of sleep is when you dream. It's called REM, which stands for Rapid Eye Movement. It's called that because our eyes move around very fast while we sleep. Our dreams feel so real, but we don't move. And even your muscles, you can see, now change completely. So your muscles are paralyzed and you can't move. And the only muscles ca that can move are the muscles for breathing, your eyes, and for hearing. Wow. It's believed we can't move because it's nature's way to prevent us from acting out our dreams and getting hurt. How come when my sister sleepwalks, she can go up and down a ladder? Well, we don't exactly know why people sleepwalk, but we do know that she's probably in stage three or four of her sleep because in REM, your muscles are paralyzed so you can't move. Children tend to sleepwalk more than adults and you tend to grow out of it. Is it dangerous to sleepwalk? No. Um, you tend to do everyday activities like fold your clothes or walk up and down the stairs. It's really weird. I'd probably like go to the fridge or play drums. Well, it's nice to know that sleepwalking is not dangerous. Except if you bump into something. That your brain is smart enough to keep your heart beating, even when you sleep. And finally, that sleep does help kids grow. We really do need to go to bed. Thanks, Anita. And thanks a lot for the nightmares. <gasps> Are you feeling better? Much better. Why do we have good and bad dreams? The Flat Earth Corner! <sighs> ah, to sleep, perchance to dream. Why indeed do we have good and bad dreams? I believe that it was not the large, lip-snackingly yummy pepperoni pizza that I had eaten before bed that caused my bad dreams. Nay, methinks it was the work of a 
demon! The mare part in nightmare is old English for demon. That's because people used to think bad dreams are caused by night demons. Nowadays, we know the only person that can give you a nightmare is yourself. <laughs> Though, having pizza before bedtime probably isn't the best idea. Your body wants to rest, not digest. But nightmares can't hurt you, so next time you're having one, think of an ending that's not scary. Say you have a dream that you're in your room when all of a sudden... Instead of being scared, oh, you again. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You're that scary nightmare my imagination created. Well, I've decided you're not so scary anymore. Oh. Nope, you're not that scary. Instead, you're going to be a balloon. <laughs> Goodbye, nightmare. <laughs> See you later. That's better. So, next time you have a bad dream, remember, you're in charge, not the thing that's scaring you. Just turn that dream into something fun, like this one, my personal favorite. I can fly. Experts say a lot of kids dream about flying. They say when we're having this kind of dream, we're allowing ourselves to experience success by using our imagination and courage. Woo! I just flew in from Las Vegas. Man, are my arms tired. Hey, what's that baby head doing in my dream? So everybody sleeps, right? Yeah. But I want to know about your dreams. So what is your weirdest dream you've ever had? My weirdest dream was when I was getting chased by a giant pink robot. <laughs> I turned into a director and then I keep saying action and everybody's not listening to me and then a random blue pig keeps coming and dancing. <laughs> My weirdest dream was when 10,000 cats were chasing me. A dog ate me. <laughs> Your dog ate you? Yes, he ate me, and when he spit me out, I did it to E.T. <laughs> when ninja was attacking me, like with ninja stars and stuff, for no reason. A lion comes into town and eats a chicken bone. He goes into um, the store, and then he eats um, the chicken bones from in there, and everyone runs out screaming like they're getting chased. <laughs> I turn into a Lego guy, and I had the secret lair and stuff. My weirdest dream is when a blue kangaroo was chasing me for no reason. My weirdest dream is when I turned into a blueberry. <laughs> a blueberry? When I turned into a small person and a guinea pig was chasing after me. <laughs> turned into a cloud and I floated all the way to China and when I came back I became a new normal human again. Well, there it is. I'll tell you that my weirdest dream was when I went to this really weird school with some really weird kids, and they started telling me about all their weird dreams. Zombies! <laughs> dreams aren't the only thing we do when we're sleeping, as Adonijah points out. How come when Grandpa sleep, they, they sound so loud? <laughs> I was going to ask your grandpa, but he was sleeping. And by the way, he does snore loudly. But I checked, and anybody can snore, no matter what age they are. When you sleep, your body relaxes, including all this stuff. When it relaxes, all that stuff in your throat blocks your air passages. So you breathe harder to get air. Then that stuff vibrates, making the snoring noise. But we do tend to snore more as we get older. That's because our muscles get weaker. So all that stuff is looser and blocks out air passages. And that's why Grandpa snores so loud. Even if you're young and not overweight, you can still snore. Uh-oh. Do try this at home. You can try the snoring experiment right now as it happens. First, tighten up your nasal cavities right here. 
Then breathe in and you should be able to make a sound like this. Did you get it? So next time you want to stay up late reading comics under the covers with a flashlight? If your parents come along... Harrison, are you still up? You can fool them into thinking you're sleeping. No, oh, I guess he's asleep. I never told you that, all right? Why don't fish die when they sleep? So to answer Yarn's question, I'm here with marine specialist Nicole Can, who can answer your question. Hi. So why don't fish die when they sleep? It's a really great question, and mostly it's because they don't sleep the same way that we do. They never get to sort of nestle into the kelp and have really sweet fishy dreams, whatever they dream about. Instead, they keep sleeping while they're swimming. So as they go around, they can shut down most of the energy levels in their bodies, keep taking in water through their mouths and passing it over their gills, but they're not really paying attention to what they're doing. They're sort of zoned out. As soon as a predator comes by, though, they can snap awake and swim away. So it's kind of like sleepwalking. Maybe sleep swimming. Sleep swimming. Do whales sleep? So do whales sleep? Absolutely they do, but they sleep completely differently than we do. It's actually my favorite thing about these whales. Like Keela here, she can turn off half of her brain at a time. Because they're mammals, like we are, they have to breathe just the same as we do. But they have to think about every single breath they take. So while one half is asleep, the other half keeps them going up to the surface to grab air, and then they can switch. And they keep going back and forth and back and forth until they've had enough rest and they can get on with their day. It's a little strange. A little bit. <laughs> so do they sleep the same amount that we do? Absolutely not. First of all, they never sleep for as long as we do. Mm -hmm. But some whales, dolphins, and even killer whales when they're babies, they might not sleep at all for the first month of their life. They don't sleep? Their parents must be more tired than mine. <laughs> what about other creatures like sea otters? Sea otters sleep too, but they do it at the surface. So they get a big group together, and sometimes they'll even actually hold paws like this to make sure that nobody floats away while they're sleeping. So everybody from whales to otters to fish, everybody sleeps, but they all sleep a little bit differently than we do. <laughs> Harrison? <laughs> I checked, and it's not only sea creatures that sleep differently than we do. Monkeys and chimpanzees like to sleep in the trees where they're safer from animals that could sneak up and attack them if they were on the ground. Giraffes and elephants don't have to worry very much about getting eaten, except when they are sleeping. So they need only three hours of sleep a day. Birds can even snooze for 30 seconds at a time when they're in the air. That's how they manage to fly non-stop when they fly away for the winter and return in the spring. Some animals sleep during the day. They don't get busy till night, like raccoons, hamsters, fireflies, and you guessed it, bats. And Cordell, that takes us back to your question that kicked off the show. Why do bats sleep upside down? The big answer is to make a quick getaway. Say, poor Mr. Bat is asleep when a hungry raccoon spots him. A bird could just quickly fly up and away, but poor old Mr. Bat can't take off fast like a bird. His wings aren't strong enough. He can only start to fly by dropping into the air. So what's a bat gonna do? Suddenly, that old raccoon lunges at Mr. Bat. Mr. Bat lets go and drops through the air. He gets up enough speed to start flying and make his getaway. Whoa, that story had me hanging on the edge of my seat. When you hang on to something, you have to think about tightening your hands around it. But for a bat, it's the opposite. Their claws naturally close. They have to consciously make them open. That keeps them from falling when they're asleep. So they have to wake up and let go and start flying. And that is why they sleep upside down. 
And just for the record, this position is very uncomfortable. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. See you next time. Ugh. Sorry about the noise. My cousin's visiting with her baby, and it's a little loud in the house. Ah, he finally went to sleep. I mean, I don't mind too much. Babies are neat, but my sister is driving me crazy today. She's copying everything I say, like this. Stop copying me. Stop copying me. I mean it. I mean it! The only defense is to say stuff she can't copy. Large Hadram Collider. Large Hadrasur Provider. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oops. I woke up the baby. I can guess what happens next. Harrison, I told you not to wake up the baby. Sorry, Mom. So I've been thinking a lot about babies and families lately, and apparently so have you, because you've sent me a lot of questions. Here's a question from Kalia. Why do we have families? The short answer is to drive us crazy. But seriously, sometimes it's hard putting up with crying babies, copycat sisters, and stressed out parents. But there must be a good reason why we have families. I'll find out the answer and your other questions about babies and families by the end of the show. Here's a question from Alana. Why are brothers annoying? Is that your little brother that copies you all the time? That is annoying. But I checked and found out there's a reason that our little brothers and sisters copy us. Have you ever heard the expression, monkey see, monkey do? Well, monkeys learn by imitating others. Us humans can't help wanting to copy. It's in our nature. It's how your parents learn to do stuff, and your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. We're naturally copycats. I know you are, but what I am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? But what am I? I know you are, 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 but what am I? I found out that copying is a good way to learn to do something. Like tracing a picture helps you learn how to draw. We always want to copy, but that's why TV shows always say, don't try this at home. But to indulge your urge, here's today's... Uh-oh, do try this at home. How good are you at monkey see, monkey do? If I play a drum rhythm, do you think you can copy it just by watching? Here. Did you get that? I'll break it down for you. And that's how I learned how to drum, by learning each thing slowly. Here's another thing I'm trying to learn. Breakdancing is really hard because you have to move super fast. But if I slow it down for you, does that make it easier? Not for me, not yet, but I'll keep practicing. Drumming and breakdancing may look like they're just fun, but they actually help our reflexes, balance, and even sharpen our mental skills, too. And when baby animals look like they're playing, they're actually learning, too. These cubs are practicing skills they'll need later on to hunt. But enough fun and games. Let's take another question. Why do turtles not care about their babies? Turtles never know their parents. Mom turtles just lay their eggs and leave. When the baby turtles hatch, they're on their own. They don't need parents around because they already know what to do. Other cold-blooded animals like frogs and lizards do the same thing. They lay eggs and leave. Animals that don't take care of their babies, 
have to lay lots of eggs because their babies get eaten by predators. Don't listen to this. Only one in a thousand turtles that are hatched survive. One in a thousand? If I were a turtle, this is how many Harrisons it would take for one of us to become a grown-up. I'm not sure how my mom would feel about having a thousand of me. She already says I'm a handful. But scientists once thought that human parents should be more like turtles. Yar, har, har. Oh. The Flat Earth Corner! I, John Watson, will prove that babies do better without parents who pay attention to them. Being loved makes babies weak. I want to raise strong, unloved babies in baby farms! A hundred years ago, this scientist named John Watson decided that attention for babies was bad. He thought that they shouldn't be picked up, cuddled, or talked to. He was wrong. Today we know that a baby's brain is busy making all kinds of nerve connections. If grown-ups don't talk to a baby, his brain can have trouble learning language. Ignoring a baby can even stunt its brain growth. Fortunately, human nature makes us want to cuddle babies and say silly things to them. Got you, good baby. <clears throat> I, I don't actually like babies. I'm just, uh, I'm just testing their hearing. Yeah, that's it. Here's a question from Brianna. Why do babies poop a lot in their diapers? Humans don't like being around poop, obviously. Uh-oh. But babies don't have a lot of control over their bodies at first. When we're born, we can't even hold our head up, much less remember to flush. So until babies are more developed, they make lots of smelly diapers. It's weird. Mr. Whiskers isn't as smart as a human, but he learned how to use a litter box right away. Cats are born wanting to bury their poop. It's their natural way of avoiding predators. Even if there are no predators in your home, your cat doesn't want to take any chances. But what about other animals? I'm here with Lisa at the zoo to learn about poo. We're here at the gorilla enclosure today, and you can see the gorillas kind of go wherever they please. It's a really, really big job for the zookeepers to clean up every day. Oh, I wouldn't want to clean that up. I guess I shouldn't really complain about cleaning up my cat's litter box. No, not really. <laughs> you know, with cats, they instinctively will go to a litter box and bury their poop because they're trying to hide their scent. Right. And with animals like dogs, they don't want to go where their den is, so you can train them to poop outside. Oh. But in the zoo, it's really more difficult because the gorillas, they'll just go where they want to go. So how much poo is created here at the zoo every day? About 15 bridge-sized garbage can fulls. Yeah. 15 garbage cans? That's a lot of poo. Ooh, ooh, where's the toilet paper? Now here's a question about animal babies from Janik. Why do animal babies grow faster than human babies? Huh. Right. I heard that animals mature in one to two years. If we did that, we'd be grown-ups before we started preschool. It's true. With the elephants that you see behind us, they seem quite helpless when they're born, but they're actually able to walk and keep up with the herd when they're only a day old. Wow, but human babies seem pretty helpless compared to that. It's true. Human babies are helpless. But other animals mature at different rates, too. For example, kittens and some birds are actually born with their eyelids fused together still. Some baby animals, like these tigers, are born very small, but they'll grow very big. Some animals, like joeys, are actually about the size of my thumb when they're born, and they're not fully mature until they're seven to 10 months. What's a joey? Oh, that's a kangaroo. Oh. They have to stay in the pouch until they're fully mature. That's so small. <laughs> so why do animals grow up at different speeds? Basically, the more complex an animal is, the longer it needs to develop. So an animal like a fish, is ready to go almost right away. Other animals take more time. Right, well, thanks for helping me find stuff out. No problem. Now Thomas has a question about babies. Why are babies so delicate? To help find out, please welcome my special guest, pediatric nurse, Stacy Baker. Oh. 
Welcome to my show. So how's my cousin's baby doing? He's perfect, just like you. <laughs> How did you calm him down? Some babies just love to be rocked and held. Do you want to hold him? I don't know. I, I, I don't actually know if I should. It's OK. Babies are not as fragile as we think they are. It's just that babies are born with really big, heavy heads, and the muscles that have to hold it up in their neck aren't very strong. So when you hold a baby, you just have to make sure that you support their neck. You want to try? Sure. Like this. Support their neck? Yeah, just make sure you hold his neck like that. There you go. Am I doing it right? You're doing a great job. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Let's rock. What do you want? It's okay. It's okay. Look. I guess I just don't have that special baby touch. <laughs> so Thomas was wondering why babies are so delicate. Well, babies are in their mummy's belly for about nine months, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have to come out because they just get too big. But they're not fully developed yet. It takes months before a baby's able to sit up, maybe four or five, six months before the baby's able to crawl, and then up to a year before the baby's able to walk. So how come humans are so helpless for so long? Our brains are really complex. Right. Uh, at nine months, they're definitely not fully developed. Actually, they're not fully developed until they're about 21 years old. In the meantime, babies are still pretty cute. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're so cute, yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> A lot of other people think so, too. Why are babies so cute? Street smarts. So what makes babies so cute? They talk funny. They're just so small and, they, yeah, they're just cute. They're naturally cute. They're just, <laughs> yeah. I like it when they sleep because their lips are like moving and then it goes like <laughs> <laughs> I can hold them and their feet are as big as my thumb and they're soft. They're soft. They're soft. <laughs> and they all love me. I just love their legs. They're just so squeezable. <laughs> <laughs> I like newborns because they have no teeth. <laughs> I just love their adorable laugh. It always makes me laugh. Hey, I think it's time that we pretend like we're babies. Uh. <laughs> Mama. <laughs> See, I told you I wasn't the only one that likes cute babies. I had to give the baby back to your cousin. I think he was hungry. Must be lucky to be that cute. I can never get away with making that much noise. I actually think that we're programmed to think that babies are cute. What do you mean by programmed? It's kind of like human animal instinct. It's built in. You mean we just know we have to take care of babies? That's how humans survive? Yeah, babies need a lot of care in the beginning. We really need to take care of them and we need to want to take care of them. Right. I found out that a lot of animals that we think are cute have the same characteristics as human babies. Oh, they're so cute with big arms and a big head and a smile. Oh, they're so cute. Oh. <coughs> Even some cartoon characters have some of the same characteristics. For instance, if I were a cartoon character and you wanted to make me look really cute, you'd make my head bigger and you'd make my eyes really large. And you'd make my arms short. And you'd probably give me a squeaky little voice, too. Aren't I a cutie pie? I wonder if that's why my sister talks baby talk every time she wants mom to buy her something. Oh, please, 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 can I have it? And it works a surprising amount of the time. Maybe my parents are programmed to think it's cute. Anyway, next time your parents tell you to stop watching cartoons, tell them you can't help it and that you're programmed to like cute, big-eyed cartoon characters. Again? Why do babies cry so much? Yeah, so you're a pediatric nurse. Why do babies have to cry all the time? Because that's the only way they have to communicate. Well, they don't have much to say. On the contrary, they actually have tons to say. Babies don't have their words until they're about one. So crying is their way of communicating how hungry they are, if they're thirsty, if they're not feeling well, if they have a tummy ache. We want them to communicate. <laughs> <sighs> so if I have a baby someday, and he doesn't start talking until he's one years old, and then he has to cry every time he wants something. So how much crying will I have to listen to? A lot. Let's see. My cousin's baby drinks milk every three hours, plus burping after every meal. 
That equals eight burps a day, plus rocking to sleep, plus four naps a day, plus a bedtime at 8 p.m., times 365 days, plus if he's too cold in the winter and too hot in the summer, my head's getting hot too. Ah! You're gonna make my head explode. How may I serve you, oh crying one? Would you like a blankie? Would you like a bottle? Would you like Harrison's favorite teddy bear, Mr. Snugglesworth, to drool all over? Harrison. 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 Oh, sorry. I didn't get much sleep last night with the baby crying. You said crying is communication, but it doesn't sound like much. Uh, yeah, actually, it is communication. And some parents actually believe that they know what the baby needs by the way that the baby cries. So do all babies have the same cries, or, or do they have different cries? Like, do they have their own? Babies all cry probably for the same things, but experts believe that certain babies cry depending on what they need, and we should understand what they need depending on basically the way they cry. I wish my parents anticipated everything that I want. Whoa, it worked. Thanks for helping us find stuff out. No problem, Harrison. Enjoy your milkshake. Speaking of milk, here's a question from Elizabeth. Why is my baby brother drink so much milk? <laughs> I found out that babies drink so much milk because for a long time, it's the only food that they can eat. Before babies can learn to swallow regular food, milk is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if you want to know who drinks more milk than your baby brother, it's time for... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challenges are Jaden... Hey. ...and Haley. Yay! A baby cow drinks two of these every single day. But he doesn't use a bottle. A baby calf drinks milk straight from his mom. Human babies can also drink milk straight from their moms. But we also drink cow milk, and to do that, we have to get the milk out of the cow. Okay, so your challenge is to milk these cows and get as much milk as you can in one minute. The person with the most milk at the end of the minute will be the winner. Sound good? Yep. Yeah. Are you ready to milk this challenge? Yeah. You have one minute. Go! Real cows have four teeth. That's the nipple that the milk comes out of. But our challengers have their hands full with two. Haley's already got the hang of it. Oh, Jaden's getting it now, too. 30 seconds. Farmers milk cows twice a day. A cow can make enough milk to fill 27 cartons every day. That's more than 100 glasses. 15 seconds. I hope the loser won't cry over spilled milk. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop milking. A pretty close race here. It looks like the winner is Haley. Yay! Congratulations. So what was it like milking a cow? It felt all wet because I was missing. It was, you were missing the bucket a lot, and what about you? It's hard. It's hard? What was the hardest part about the challenge? Aiming the bucket. The hurting of the thumbs. Oh, your thumbs started to hurt? Awesome. Well, thanks for playing my great challenge. And I'll never take a milkshake for granted again. Here's another question. Why are the parents so bossy? Good question, Grayson. I checked the answer, and it turns out human parents aren't the only ones. Animal parents are bossy too, from elephants to kangaroos. Any mammal in the zoo is telling its own kids what to do. Wipe your paws, don't play with your prey. Crowds will scare the humans away. Get in a cave and go to sleep. Don't provoke the wild beasts. Animal parents are bossy too, so animal kids learn what to do. Animal parents are bossy too, so animal kids learn what to do. Yeah!
It turns out the reason parents are bossy is because they have to keep us safe and teach us how to be grown-ups. I know you are, but what I am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are. They learned how to do that from their parents. I know you are, but what am I? Who learned it from their parents? Who learned it from their parents? You are, but what am I? I guess that brings us back to the question that gave birth to this show. Why do we have families? The big answer is... Survival! Living in families helped our human ancestors survive. It helps us, too. Families take care of us when we're sick and when we're babies and can't do anything for ourselves. And we can take care of them, too. We're all better off when we take care of each other. Even if sometimes we drive each other crazy. I know you only copy me because you want to be just like me. Gross! I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. <laughs>
<laughs> Just kidding. But you know what's amazing? Reptiles never stop growing. They grow their whole lives. Hey, come back with my house. Okay, my pet gecko won't get that big. Even though reptiles keep growing, they slow down when they get old. But some can still get pretty big. Who's the biggest? The saltwater crocodile is probably the biggest reptile alive. The biggest turtle is the leatherback sea turtle. Its babies can fit in your hand, but they grow to be as long as your bed. And some pythons can be almost four times as tall as I am. People used to think dinosaurs were reptiles. That would have made them the biggest reptiles ever. How's it going, big guy? Today, scientists think dinosaurs were their own group of animals. They weren't reptiles. But I wonder, could dinosaurs be those dragons that we hear stories about? Nope. My research says that dinosaurs were extinct way before humans existed. I guess I have to take some more questions. Here's one from Sammy. How do some reptiles crawl on walls? To find out how reptiles climb the walls, please welcome reptile expert, Pat Benatar. Hi, Harrison. Hey. Thank you for having me on your show. This is my lizard, Spike. Oh, I sure hope he doesn't climb my walls. It looks like he'd scratch them all up. Actually, this is not a wall climber. His feet are not made for climbing walls, but your gecko sure can. Oh, he sure does. Look, he's climbing, but how come your lizard can't do that? Your gecko has little hairs on the end of each of his toes that help him to stick to things with static electricity. Hairs? I don't see any hairs on his feet. Well, it's kind of like this. If I take this balloon and rub it on you, it'll stick. That's static electricity. That's what we believe happens with geckos. It's still a bit of a mystery. I wish I could use my hands and feet to walk on walls. Actually, scientists are working on something like that, but you won't find that in anybody's home anytime soon. I wonder if I could get some good ideas from... If you were going to climb a wall, how would you do it? I would put sticky stuff on my hands and feet and then I'd be able to climb. I would fly. I would put suction cups on my hands and feet. I would call Superman and he'd lift me up onto the roof. I can cut a hole in the roof. Then I can use the ladder, and I can yell the, I'm in the top in the world! <laughs> well, I would grab some trampoline. I'd start bouncing and bouncing and bouncing until I got high enough to, like, cart myself on the roof. Does that sound safe? No! Well, sometimes my mom says that I make her climb the walls. <laughs> Lance had another question about how reptiles walk. How do snakes move without legs? For critters without legs, snakes really get around. The secret is scales. A snake's scales grip the ground sort of like the bottom of your sneakers. And I found out that snakes can move in four different ways. By scrunching itself up, then stretching out in front. By wiggling in an S pattern. By sidewinding, which is sort of like flinging itself. Or by creeping like a caterpillar. To find out more about how snakes move, it's time for... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are... Jordan. Yeah! Charles. Yeah! Tristan. Yeah! And Veronica. Yeah! So you're probably wondering why you're dressed up in these snake costumes. Yeah. 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 Well, today, you're gonna pretend to be snakes and race to the finish line, and the first one to eat their gummy mice will be the winner. Good? Yeah! Okay, and Pat is here to provide some tips to get you there the fastest. Okay, what you guys gotta do is you gotta slither like snakes. Now, don't forget, snakes don't have arms or legs, so you've gotta press your parts of your body onto that mat and squirm yourself forward. Move along just like a snake. You guys have a goal. You gotta get to that gummy mouse and eat it. Okay. Slither like snakes. Are you ready? Yeah! Get set and go! Oh, look at this. I think Jordan has a good technique down. Yeah, he's got it going on there. Look at that. Getting oh, Jordan's oh, already. Jordan's way ahead. <laughs> and he's getting the gummy mouse. Come on, Veronica, you can get up there. I think Jordan's got it. Jordan's got it. Yeah. Get there. Uh, 
And then second place, we got Charles. <laughs> Veronica's stuck. Come on, Veronica. Still in like a snake. Dig in and move. You can do it. You're almost there. She's almost there. Slither, slither. <laughs> Jordan was so fast. She's gonna get, get it. it. Get, get it. it. Get it. Get the gummy mouse. There we go. You do it. There yeah. Go. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> so it looks like Jordan's our winner. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So what was your slithery technique that you used to get to the finish line? What I did is I used my shoulders and put them really into the ground, and I didn't really like just go like this. I actually turned a lot and actually put my shoulders into the ground. So you like turned your whole body to get into yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, nice. And what about you? Um, I tried to do as big zigzags as possible to pull me from side to side to go across. Right. I used my feet and, my, and pretty much every part of my body that sticks out a bit to dig into the mat and push myself forward. Well, my technique was that if I go left to right, it would work, but it didn't work as much. So you guys did great. You basically moved like snakes. So I have a little prize for every one of you. More gummy mice. Yay! <laughs> Geez, snakes are so hungry. <laughs> so obviously, snakes don't really eat gummy mice. But here's another question about that. What do reptiles eat? Reptiles can eat bugs, fish, and small animals. Oh, and snakes can eat big animals like deer. Wait, what? How is it possible? A deer is this big, and a snake's mouth is only that big. How can a snake even do it? How does his mouth not rip open, or his head not explode? And, uh-oh, my head's starting to overload! Ah! I think my head would explode if I tried to eat something that big. Well, actually, when snakes eat, they dislocate the back of their jaws like this so that they can swallow things larger than their heads. Whoa, so they can just unhook their jaw like that? Exactly. Wow, this gives me an idea for... Uh-oh, dude, try, try this, this at home. home. Want to know how big of a bite you could take if you were a snake? Open your mouth as wide as you can and measure. Now expand it by this much. If you were a snake, you could eat a whole watermelon in one bite. <laughs> Speaking of weird things about snakes, Paolo had a question. How can a snake not die if it has poison? That is weird, but I found out that it's because snake venom is different from poison. It is weird that a venomous snake doesn't die from its own venom inside of it, but I'm pretty sure that Pat knows the answer. The difference between venom and poison is that venom has to be in the bloodstream for it to work, whereas poison has to be swallowed. Venomous snakes actually inject their venom into their prey and it helps them to pre-digest their food. Oh, I saw this video where a venomous snake eats another venomous snake. Is that true? Yeah, many venomous snakes eat other venomous snakes. Once again, the venom has to be injected into the blood, so that venomous snake, if you got bitten by the other one, that could be deadly. But just by digesting it, it's not a problem at all. Well, I bet snakes don't taste good. Believe it or not, some people eat rattlesnakes. Eat rattlesnakes? I'm pretty sure there's an easier lunch to catch than that. Speaking of venomous snakes, I found videos of some of the most dangerous snakes in the world, like the puff adder and the black mamba in Africa, the tiger snake in Australia, the desert horned viper in the Middle East, the common crate, and the world's largest venomous snake, the king cobra in Asia. And in North America, the rattlesnake is one of the most poisonous snakes. You didn't bring a rattlesnake with you, did you? Fooled you. I always fall for pranks. You know who hates pranks? Snakes. Do not poke, do not provoke. Snakes who cannot take a joke. Don't give a cobra stinky gum or ring in at her spell and run. Their bite's no fun, their bite's no fun. Don't photobomb a viper class or stick your tongue out at an ass. 
You'll be sad if it gets mad Because that fright could be your last Their bite's no fun, their bite's no fun Yeah! I guess snakes can't take a joke. <laughs> oh, apparently I can't take a joke very well either. Thanks, Pat, for being on my show. My pleasure. Now here's another question from Brianna. How come reptiles have to go on rocks to stay warm? To answer your question, I'm here with my friend, Little Ray, at his own reptile zoo. Hey Harrison, thanks for having me on the show. And this is the hammer, one of our green iguanas that we have at the zoo. <laughs> so reptiles like to sunbathe, why is that? Well, reptiles unlike us are ectothermic or cold-blooded. We're endothermic or warm-blooded. And what this means is that we can control our own body temperature. If we get too hot, we sweat to cool down. Too cold, we can shiver to warm up. Mm -hmm. Reptiles like the hammer can't do that. His body temperature is actually uh, controlled by the temperature of his surroundings. He's looking pretty warm right now. Should we try to cool him off? Well, he will sit under a heat lamp like this to warm himself up or under the sun. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he can get really hot. But when he gets too hot, we don't have to do anything to cool him down. He will actually physically move to a cooler area if he starts to get too hot. This rock is too hot. Ouch. This rock is too cold. This rock is just right. Ah. Oh, yeah. Ah. I saw something really weird that happens to reptiles when they get too cold. Does this really happen? Well, it actually, it does. If reptiles do get too cold, especially if they're living in a place where they're not supposed to be, or there's a cold snap, uh, when they get really cold, their bodies will just start to shut down and they just can't move very well. So if they're up in a tree, if it's windy, if all of a sudden a branch moves, if they try to walk, if they lose their grip, they just can't kind of re-grab on. And iguanas and other reptiles can fall out of trees. So do you get them air conditioners in the summer and heaters in the winter? Well, we, we do have to control their uh, the heat in their habitat, but what we do is we keep the zoo at a comfortable temperature for people, and then we use heat lamps and heat pads, and the reptiles are able to kind of manage their own body temperature on their own. We give them the choice and they go where they like. Cool. Next question. It's from Jesse. Why is a crocodile's back so hard? Oh, I know the answer. That's easy. So an action hero can cross a river on a crocodile's back. Ow! Ooh, ah, <laughs> I'm sure there's more to it than that. Let's just ask the crocodile. The I don't know. Or maybe Little Ray instead. So, why do crocodiles have hard backs? Well, Harrison, crocodiles have osteoderms in their skin. And right. osteoderms are bony plates that are actually inside their skin. You can actually touch them if you want. Not gonna bite? Nope, you're gonna be fine. Okay. And when you're touching them, you're actually touching skin. These little bumps that you see are yeah. bones that are inside their skin, not under their skin, not on top of their skin, but she's covered in skin just like we have, and these are bone plates that they have for armor. Actually, if you wanna hold them, just put your really? hand underneath like that and grab them at the base of his tail, just like that. So what's the advantage of having the bones inside of the skin like that? Well, crocodilians are highly social animals. Uh, they do live in groups and they're super powerful and they will fight. And if you look, base of the skull, their yeah. neck, the core parts of their body, the base of their tail, that's where these really heavy armored plates are. If they do get in a fight, all the armor is in the core parts of their body. Right. Well, you should probably take them back before I get bit. I got them for you, buddy. <laughs> cool. Well, Yasmina had another question about reptiles. Are most reptiles dangerous? So, are most reptiles dangerous? Like, what about this guy? He doesn't look very dangerous to me. Well, most reptiles are not dangerous, but some of them, when they are dangerous, some can be very dangerous. Venomous snakes, big crocodiles, things like that. This guy, on the other hand, certainly doesn't look like he's overly dangerous, doesn't look too big. However, he has razor sharp teeth. Uh, and a bite from this one, Harrison, you would probably be getting a few dozen stitches if it's a simple bite from him. So as much as he doesn't look too bad, you do have to respect that different animals certainly can be very dangerous. So what does he eat? Invertebrates, giant walking sticks, and things. He eats uh, small birds, lizards, sometimes small mammals that live high in the canopy of the rainforest in New Guinea, where he comes from, lives high up in the trees. So he doesn't eat people, does he? No, he doesn't eat people, but he is a cousin of the Komodo dragon, one of the most infamous lizards in the world, and they have been documented actually attacking and killing people. 
Yikes. Ah, uh, well, this guy's starting to make me nervous now. What if he gets out? Well, he won't get out, Harrison, but for the kids out there, if you're ever exploring and you see an animal in the wild, you should just not approach them, leave them alone. Most reptiles are harmless. However, there are some dangerous animals out there that you might not think are. Right, well, thanks for being on my show. Harrison, thanks a lot, buddy. See you later. See you later, alligator. You'd never hurt me, would you? You're not like a Komodo dragon. Hey! Komodo dragon! That might be the answer to the mystery that started us off. Do dragons really exist? <laughs> the big answer is... Sort of. The dragon monsters we hear about in stories aren't real, but some dragon myths probably come from exaggerations of real reptiles. Snakes that open their jaws to eat something bigger than they are. Giant lizards that bite. Lizards whose tongues look like flames. See, I wasn't making it up. Okay, maybe the fire breathing part. And the magic part. And the invisible part. I guess if you've never seen a snake or a lizard before and someone started telling you about them and they were exaggerating about them, then maybe you'd start to believe that they were actually really giant dragons that existed. Fortunately, there are no dragons in my attic. <laughs> Did I fool you? Well, reptiles aren't scary, fire-breathing monsters at all. Ah! I thought you were a nice reptile. Ah! See you next time for more finding stuff out. Ah! I wish you could smell these because they inspired this beautiful show. The how do flowers poop? <laughs> well, Jacob. I never really thought of that. Now that you're asking, I think I'm gonna stop sniffing those flowers until I find out the answer. Well, I don't know how flowers poop, or even if they do, but thanks for giving me an excuse to do a show on, well, you know. Why is bird poop white? <laughs> Here's the first thing I noticed about those bird droppings. I noticed that these bird droppings are very runny compared to regular human, well, you know. You won't believe what I just found out. Birds poo and pee at the same time. The white part is the pee, and the little black parts you see in it are the poop. So, if you get splatted on by a bird, remember, the bird isn't just pooping on you, it's peeing on you too. Now here's a question from Sophia. What animal does the biggest poop? I checked, and there are some champion poopers out there. This is a moose-sized poop. And this is a hippo-sized poop. But it doesn't come out neat like this. It goes all over the place like it was shot out of a cannon. And there's an animal that makes even bigger poop than the hippo, the blue whale. And I found out its poop is reddish-orange because of the orange seafood it eats. Oh. And its poop is so big, I don't even have enough clay to show you the amount of poop. It makes so much poop in one day, it weighs the amount of a baby elephant. That's enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool every year. Hey, cannonball! Ew, who let the whale in the pool? So remember, never swim behind a blue whale. Now here's a question from Madison. What happens to poop after a century? To find out, please welcome my special guest, paleontologist, Jordan Mallon. Hey. Hi, Harrison. I, uh, I brought something for you. Cool. A rock. Well, actually, it's a piece of dinosaur poop. Ew, you handed me poop? Yeah, only the best for you. Oh, OK. How old is all this poop here? It's pretty old. It's actually millions of years old. Millions? Well, that's definitely more than a century. So what happens to this poop? 
Well, normally poop will degrade, but in this case we have some examples of some fossilized poop. That is poop that has been replaced by minerals over millions of years. So they're like rocks now. Yeah. What is this one? This one's so big. Like It's actually a piece of T-Rex poop. Um, the only example of its kind in existence. Can I touch it? Absolutely. <laughs> It's so weird looking. <laughs> How does it like become like this? What happens is most of this fossilized poop comes from carnivores. And the reason being that carnivores usually eat a lot of bone and the minerals in that bone allow the poop to be fossilized more easily. So most of the fossil poop that we have in the fossil record is from carnivores. The poop herbivore dinos made was runnier and softer than carnivore poop. So it decomposed and disappeared faster. You have to be very lucky to find fossilized herbivore poop. The really interesting thing about herbivores is they have to eat plants all day long in order to get enough food, enough nutrition. Because they're always digesting this plant material, their stomachs are constantly producing nauseous gas called methane. Basically, these animals poop all day long and they would have been quite stinky to see back 65 million years ago. <laughs> but at least they don't stink now. Well, why don't you take a smell for yourself? <laughs> I hope it doesn't stink. It smells fine, it smells great. <laughs> it's basically just rock. Thanks for being on my show and showing me all of this poop. <laughs> it was my pleasure, Harrison, thanks for having me on. And while we're on the subject of stinky stuff, let's get some... Today, we're in a bathroom to talk about farts. So you've all farted before, right? Yeah! Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, what makes you fart? Anything. Mm. Asparagus. <laughs> Cheese. And oh guts. my gosh. When he farts, you can literally see the green gas. <laughs> no see the word. <laughs> I don't fart. I can fart on command. Don't do it. Yes. No. 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 Anything unhealthy, really? <laughs> Just beans. Cake, peanut butter and jam sandwiches, and sometimes milk. And what did you just eat? Peanut butter and jam sandwiches to drink. I had a glass of milk. Oh. Sorry. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of all your questions. Here's another. Why do people poop? I'm glad you asked, Olivia, because it gives me a chance to replay one of my favorite Finding Stuff Out songs. What happens to our food? Well, if it tastes good, first we chew, then we swallow. Down to our stomach, where it's hollow. Enzymes there, break it down. When they're done, it gets passed around to the small intestine, seven meters long, takes nutrients out to make us strong. The large intestine absorbs the water, just like a giant paper blotter. And that, my peeps, is the scoop, and what we can't use turns into poop. Yeah, what we can't use turns into poop. You may have remembered this from the show where I answered your questions about food, but there's more to the story about why we need to poop. Other stuff that we can't use comes out in our daily food. Bacteria is part of that waste. Dead cells that our body replaced and fiber from the plants we ate, but water makes up most of the waste. That's why. But sometimes how doesn't go so smoothly. Here's a question from Catherine. How does a person become constipated? <laughs> Do you ever have that problem? I guess I'll never know. Because you can't talk. Well, this is how it happens to people. Some foods have fiber, which we can't digest. But even though our body can't digest it, Fiber is still important because it tickles the lining of our intestines. Gucci! <laughs> but foods without fiber, like cheese and meat, don't tickle our intestines, so they can sit there a long time. And while they're sitting there, our bowels draw water out of them, making them drier and harder, which is why it can hurt to get constipated. So eat lots of food with fiber in them, and also... Uh-oh, dude, try, try this, this at, at home. home. I checked, and besides eating high fiber food, there's something else you can do to help you if you get constipated. Drink a glass of water to help soften your poop, and do some light exercises to help get those bowels moving. Ooh. 
But maybe don't do both at the same time. Uh-oh. I'll be right back. Meanwhile, here's a question from Adriana. When you eat corn, why when you poop it comes out? To find out the answer to your question, I've come deep into the woods. And to help me is wildlife biologist, Dr. Murray Humphreys. Hi, Harrison, how are you doing? Welcome to my show. Glad to be here. So, is your job really studying poop? Well, yeah, I study wildlife, and a great way to learn about wildlife is to study their poop. It's one of the ways we can tell what animals have been eating, because anything that's left undigested shows up in their poop. Maybe like corn or something. You got it, just like corn. And hey, look right there, I see some poop. Oh, whoa. So what kind of animal do you think left this, Harrison? Looks like it could be a rabbit or something. Well, a rabbit would be perfectly round, but you see how it's a bit oval? That yeah. means it's been left by a white-tailed deer. Put this on. A mask? What is this for? Well, we got to pick this poop up, Harrison. What? Ew. And before you pick up the poop, you want to put a mask on. There's some dangerous stuff in animal poop, and you don't want to get it in your mouth. Just so we don't get sick. That's right. There we go. And That's just there. great. Oh, wonderful. We'll find some other poop in the next one you're gonna pick up, Harrison. What? That's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be magical. Time to find some poop. Could be anywhere, eh? Yeah. What's that right there, Harrison? Oh, that's a huge poop. Has to be something big, like maybe a bear. You got it, that's a bear poop. It's not even a big bear poop. They can be huge. Well, I guess I should put my mask on. Go for it, Harrison. Let's pick, pick it up. up. Let's poop. Uh, which piece should I grab? Oh, give as much as you can. Oh, it's all warm. <laughs> oh, this is so gross. <laughs> oh, perfect. Got well, it. I'll take that from you. Yeah, you can take care of that. Can't wait to see what this guy's been eating. Put it in there. Keep it safe. It's safe. <laughs> We'll find one more, huh? One more. Let's go find right. some poop. Let's go looking. Right there, more poop. Oh, look at that one. That's <laughs> a beauty. You can pick it up this time. You're the pro. OK, that's a coyote poop. I'm sure of it. But we'll go take it back to the lab, have a closer look. Awesome. Uh, away we go. Let's go. So let's start with the coyote. It's kind of the biggest bones and obvious here. Anytime you look at a bone like that, it's pretty hard to tell where that's from, what kind of animal. But yeah. the best thing is if you can happen to find some teeth. Oh, oh there's crap. a couple right there. Look at those teeth right there, huh? So we'll be able to tell what he's eating. Yeah, the teeth are a lot more characteristic of which mammal it's from. I think that must be from a squirrel. So now we know the coyote's been eating squirrels. You've got it. If we take a look at the, uh, the bear. bear next, why don't you take a look at this one? See if you can poke in there. It gets a little smaller. Bears aren't likely to yeah. be eating things with big there's bones. No, yeah, there's bones. no bones in here. But you see the grass, and maybe you see some berries, and so it means they eat all sorts of stuff. Right, and now the deer. The deer. It's actually the hardest to tell because we know a deer is a herbivore. It <laughs> only eats plant matter, and plants are pretty hard to see. They don't stick out like big bones or anything. Yeah. And so you got to look a little closer for that. So we take a little piece and then get it underneath the microscope. Have a look and see what you see. Oh, well, it's just like particles and stuff. Yeah, a bunch of what we call it is cell walls. You just see the undigestible part of the plants that are left. Right. And each of those walls has a characteristic shape. So depending on what it looks like, that's how you know what type of plant it exactly. is. Exactly. Was it eating willows or alders or what kind of tree or what kind of shrub or what kind of flower was it eating? So I guess analyzing poop like this is pretty important. It really is. It tells you a lot about an animal. It tells you what they eat, their health, are they in good condition or bad. It can even tell you whether they're endangered or not. So you really learn a lot. Wow. Well, thanks so much for helping me find stuff out. It's great. It's a pleasure to meet you, Harrison. And this gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today, my challengers are team number one, Stefano and Joey. What up? And we also have team number two, Lily and Sabia. Hi! So, do you know what's under these plates? A sugar cream pie. Candy! You're all wrong, but today your challenge is to figure out what kind of animals that... This poop belongs to. It's either going to be a herbivore, an animal that eats plants, a carnivore, an animal that eats meat, or an omnivore. That's an animal that eats both. Oh, but it's not real poop. It's my poop. <laughs> I mean, poop that I made. To make my fake poop, I mix some water, brown food coloring, vegetable oil, salt, and flour. Just stir the whole thing and squish it with your hands until it looks like really nice poop. You'll have to dig through the poop to figure out what kind of animal it is. Okay. Sound good? So team one, you're up first. Team two, you'll have to go downstairs to the bathroom. Oh. Make yourself comfortable. Are you guys ready? Yeah! All right, here's the first poop for you to dig into. Ew! Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's go, Joe. Oh, oh, I see something. I see something. Oh, it's a bone. 
What about this type of... Hey, this one looks like whiskers. Must have ate a bunny or a cat. Uh, carnivore. That's right. That fake poop is supposed to be wolf poop. What? And wolves are carnivores. One, two, three, go. <gasps> oh, I've seen this one before. Got something, got something. It's me. Oh. What does it look like, ribs? This is fish. Mm. I think it's an omnivore. Omnivore, that's right, and it's from a bear. Bears eat lots of different kinds of food, including berries and fish, so I put that in my fake bear poop. Pull Ready, let's go. Oh. Uh -huh. I got something, I got something, enjoy, we're, we're going on something. Oh, piece of grass. Herbivore. That's also right. Oh, wow. Number three. <laughs> oh, Joey! <laughs> This fake poop is supposed to look like horse poop. It really oh. does. <laughs> yeah. Ready? Go. What? Out of the way, Joe. Oh! It eats bugs. This looks like seeds. I wonder what it could be. I think I got it. I think it's an omnivore. You're right. It's a raccoon. Yeah, oh. raccoon. Raccoons eat all kinds of weird things, including what is in our garbage cans. In this fake poop, there's a mix of seeds, nuts, and crickets. <laughs> Oh, wow, we're pretty good at guessing. <laughs> Got your back! Woohoo! Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here's your first poop to dig into. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Since we found all the bones, we think it's the um, carnivore. You're right! It's fake wolf poop. Go. Oh, this one. Oh, this is disgusting. <laughs> Ew. 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 Are those fish bones? Ew. Oh. Look. Oh. A cranberry or something? It's a fruit. Omnivore? That's right. It's fake bear poop. Oh. Go for it. <laughs> oh. oh. Grass? I think we guessed already. Ready. Herbivore? That's right, it's a herbivore. Mm. And this is a horse poop. <gasps> no, oh, no, ew. Here we go. What is this? I don't know. <gasps> is that a bug? <laughs> I see nuts. An omnivore? Yes, it's an omnivore. And it's fake raccoon poop. <gasps> oh, okay, that's disgusting. <laughs> Okay, so the winner is Team 1! Yeah! And Team 2! Yeah! It's a tie! Oh, wow! All this poop makes me think of a question I got from Dante. Can poop be a cycle? Ugh. The Flat Earth Corner! Can it be recycled? Big time! Here in ancient Egypt, we astronomers know all about that. The ancient Egyptians saw that dung beetles recycled poop by eating it and even laying their eggs in it to give new dung beetles the energy to grow. When the ancient Egyptians saw that dung beetles could move balls of poop across the land, they concluded the dung beetle must be the power that makes the sun move across the sky. To them, the dung beetle was sacred and was the god of the rising sun. It renewed the sun every day before rolling it above the horizon, then carried it through the other world after sunset. They actually thought a mystical dung beetle named Capri carried the sun from the other world every morning and took it back there every night. So their scientific method wasn't perfect. <laughs> the ancient Egyptians were wrong about dung beetles making the sun move across the sky but there was a connection between the two. The sun is the source of the energy that makes plants grow. Animals eat the plants, then poop out the dung, which the dung beetle uses for food for itself and its babies. So yeah, poop gets recycled in a lot of different ways, but here are some of the weirdest. These wild civet cats eat beans from the coffee tree, then poop them out. People harvest those pooped out beans to make a unique kind of coffee called Kopi Luwak. It's the most expensive in the world. And there's even a toilet that turns our poop into energy. It's called the Luat. It's modeled from 90% horse poop. It doesn't use any water, and the human poop that gets collected in it is turned into energy. 
In Germany and lots of other countries, thousands of power plants transform the methane gas in animal and human poop into electricity. Poop is actually becoming an important source of energy. I'm an important source of energy. No. You can even live in dung. Cow dung can be recycled into bricks to build houses with. They're lighter and stronger than regular clay bricks. Animal scat is also used for paper. Like this notepad. It was made from elephant poop. I'll never forget that. And some people even think they can make you beautiful. In Japan, seagull droppings are used in face cream. I know what you're thinking. Seagull droppings really do give you nice skin. Just kidding. It's just normal moisturizer. You didn't think I was gonna actually put poop on my face, would you? Here's another question. This one's from Sydney. Why can you eat food, but then since poo is made out of food, then you can't eat poo? You're right that humans can't eat poop. Here's why. Bacteria in our intestines, that's the part down here, are perfectly safe down there. But the bacteria come out of our bodies and poop. And if they get into other parts of our body, like our mouth, they could make us really, really sick. That's why it's so important to wash your hands with soap after you go to the bathroom. But you want to hear something really gross? I found out there's an Italian type of cheese called panaroni that's made by mixing milk with cow poop. The cow poop helps turn the milk into cheese. Fortunately, the heat it takes to make the cheese kills the bacteria in the poop that might otherwise make us sick. Gorillas actually do eat their own poop to get extra nutrients that they missed the first time. Unlike us, they don't get sick from it. Just thinking about that makes me feel really, really sick. But gorillas aren't the only ones. Plants like fertilizer made from animal dung. It has nutrients that help them grow. Yeah, you do like poop, don't you? But do you make your own? Well, it's time to answer the question that led us through the bowels of science. So how do flowers poop? <laughs> The big answer is... Quietly. All living things make waste, whether they're a tiny insect or a giant blue whale. Flowers make waste too, but not poop like us. Some of their waste comes out in sap and sticky goo called resins. And some of what is waste to them is actually useful to us. Like the oxygen that we breathe. But plant waste doesn't have the same gases in it as our poop does so it actually smells good. Well, that's the end of my show. See you next time for more. Dad, couldn't you wait until after the credits roll? Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. My mom's making me clean while I do the show today because something up here stinks really bad. It isn't you, is it? Nope. At first, I thought it was this banana that I found under my sofa. And then I thought it might have been this tuna and onion sandwich that I found in my backpack. But it's not. It's something else. Something worse. Fortunately, you sent me a lot of questions about garbage this week, and I'm hoping that the answers will help me find the source of this mystery smell. The first question is from Alicia. What happens to stuff that goes in the trash? The short answer is... It will start to stink. But seriously, I don't know. But by the end of the show, I'll find out the answer to that and all your other questions about garbage. Here's a question from Quasi. Why does garbage stink? Ugh. Right now, I'd be happy just to know where this stink is coming from. But let's take a look at the garbage with my Super Zoom-O-Matic. Keep watching. See those tiny creatures crawling around? I call them garbage-eating monsters. But I found out they're really called fungi and bacteria. They break down food garbage and eat it. When they munch on the trash, they create lots of stinky garbage. It's sort of like the way your stomach makes stinky gases when you digest food. Hey, I smell a song coming on. Break it down when garbage breaks down, the gases go up as fungi and bacteria go chomp, chomp, chomp. When garbage breaks down, the trash can go. <laughs> if it's old and there's mold, hold your nose, there it goes. When that breakdown starts, it's like the trash can burps and farts. Excuse me. Stinky gases aren't all bad, though. 
Scientists have found a way to take natural gases from rotting trash and create energy. We're not at the point yet where we can all heat our houses with rotting bananas. So in the meantime, here's a good thing to do with old food scraps. This is where my family keeps some of our slimiest garbage, like last week's leftover salad. Imagine how I felt when my mom said she was making my snack with this stuff. Ugh. Let me show you what happened. Harrison, I made a snack for you. Harrison, where are you? I have a really good snack for you, Harrison. Where'd that boy go? Harrison, a good snack. Yummy, yummy. Harrison. Turns out the snack was just some berries from our garden. This is a special kind of garbage called compost, made from food scraps. When it rots, you spread it on your garden. It's like super food for plants. To find out how garbage turns into compost, please welcome my special guest, naturalist Julie Hamill. Hey, Harrison. Hey. What's that smell? Oh, sorry, it's a mystery. Oh, worm? No offense, but aren't we supposed to keep bugs out of the kitchen? Well, actually, I'm here today to show you that we can keep it in the kitchen. So there's worms inside, and you actually take fruit scraps and you put it inside. So we can put these in? Yeah. So we just get it down in Mix it there. up, right? So it helps the worms to eat them all. So how many worms are in here? There's about 100. That's a lot. Yeah, they actually multiply. You put a couple of them, and they will multiply in weeks, and you'll have more than that. They will create worm poop. And there's inside, there's poop mixed with the soil. Worm poop? That's disgusting. Well, it's not that bad because it's full of nutrients, right? So you get earth mixed with a lot, a lot of nutrients, which is really good for your plants. So does that mean it's good to let bugs go inside of your garbage? Well, actually, worms are good, but you don't want cockroaches or fruit flies to come in. As like you can these? see there, yeah, there's fruit flies. Oh, yeah, there's little fruit flies all over the fruit. And why, why are they so bad? Because what they do, they lay their eggs in fruit, and then it will be rotten and will smell a lot, so we really, really don't want that in your compost. That's not very good. Well, thanks for helping us find stuff out. You want to start your own compost? Yeah. Here you go. Ew, I'm, I'm holding worm poop. Perfectly natural. <laughs> well, at least I'll be able to start a composter now. Thanks. What would happen if we didn't recycle? I checked, and not all trash gets eaten by fungi or bugs. Things like plastic take a really, really long time to decompose, so toys you throw away now could still be in the dump when you're really old. At least I still have my teeth. Some things like styrofoam and kitchen appliances might never dissolve on their own. If we didn't recycle, all that stuff would just pile up. I found out that if you add up all the garbage humans throw away every year, it's enough to fill garbage trucks stretching from here to the moon. Yeah. Enough garbage to reach to the moon? That's more than 38,000 kilometers of trash in one year. How many candy wrappers is that? Uh-oh, will we have enough trash one day that will reach all the way to Mars? That is so much garbage. What can we do with it? Where will it all go? Ah! We make so much garbage, it's hard to find a place to put it all. Sometimes the dump gets so full that we have to send our trash away. But eventually, the places we send it to will fill up also. Some people try to solve the problem by burning garbage. But that can make a lot of smelly air pollution. Others dump trash into rivers, streams, and oceans. In the Pacific Ocean, there's actually a garbage patch bigger than Switzerland bigger than Japan. It's about the size of Texas. That's because the ocean currents carry garbage to places where it builds up. Even your ordinary household garbage can be dangerous to animals that live in the water. So the answer to your question is that if we didn't recycle, eventually we'd have mounds of garbage everywhere. Fortunately, humankind has a plan. I found out you're supposed to do three things. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce just means to use less stuff, which makes less garbage. So to get some ideas on how to do that, let's get some... Street Smarts! Hi, I'm here to talk to some kids about trash. So how many bags of trash do you think the average person makes in a year? 20. 
19, 62, 14, 70. So on average, kids like you weigh about four trash bags. Now here's the answer. A typical person goes through 100 trash bags per what? year. That's like 25 kids. That's like the whole class. And now I'm a piece of garbage. <laughs> So how can we make less garbage? Using it again. Recycling. Reusing. Composting. If you use paper, don't waste it that quickly. Eat less canned food, because there'll be less cans thrown out. Get a robot to eat it. Yum, yum. Around the world, people reuse things in ingenious ways. In the Caribbean, musicians make instruments out of old steel drums. In Africa, some kids make cool race cars out of scrap wire. And anywhere in the world, an old tire can make a great swing. Sorry, but I thought the stink was coming from the recycling bin. But it's not. Recycling is for non-stinky things, like glass, metal, or plastic. Sabriel had a question about that. How does stuff get recycled? A recycling center is like a super destructo machine. Glass gets crushed so it can be cleaned and melted into new glass. And so does metal. That means it won't end up in the trash heap. Paper gets turned into gooey pulp so it can be made into new paper. That means fewer trees need to be cut down. Recycling can save entire forest worth of trees. But what happens when you have an old TV or computer that you need to throw away? It has plastic and glass and metal. So where does it go? Well, it's where I'm going right now. I'm here at Sims Recycling Solutions, where they take old TVs, monitors, and video games to come get recycled. And Cindy Coots knows all about how to do that. Welcome to Sims Recycling Solutions. Thanks. So how much stuff does get recycled here? We actually recycle 60 million pounds of old electronics from across Canada and the US at this site. 60 million pounds a year? That's more than the weight of two and a half elephants every hour. I'm going to introduce you to Kurt, who is our expert dismantler. Hey, nice to meet you. That cord contains copper that we're going to recycle. There you go, that's the plastic housing. There we go. Now Kurt is gonna take all the connections, okay. the electronics off. Now he's taking off something called the yoke. And you're gonna see that that yoke has a lot of copper in it. Okay. Recycled copper is really useful, but if you just throw it out, that's bad. Just like the lead in my picture tube that is highly toxic to humans. Most people throw their monitors into the trash, ends up in a landfill, right. it rains, the rain picks up some lead, yeah. and that's not good for the environment or for not people. Good. <laughs> I guess I won't be able to find stuff out on that monitor anymore. Well, the beauty of recycling is that all those resources are going to be recycled to make a new monitor. For me? For you or anyone else. Awesome! Plastic, metal, or glass. Each material of my monitor has to be recycled separately. So you can imagine if we're processing 60 million pounds of monitors and TVs, mm -hmm. we need a lot of people. Right. So we actually have equipment that can take this apart, 20,000 pounds an hour. That's 400 TVs or monitor every hour. That is a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> Thanks for being on my show. You're very welcome. And remember, don't ever throw out your old electronics. Make sure you recycle. I'll make sure to recycle. <laughs> Uh-oh, do try this at home. Once you've cleaned everything that you're gonna recycle, you can crush it and make it really flat so that you can fit more into the container. With aluminum cans, there's a special trick. Crush it from top to bottom, but make sure not to cut yourself on any sharp edges. Presto, you just made a can cake, a robot's favorite treat. Yum, yum. <laughs> I've got to find that stink. Oh, well. The show must go on. 
Why do you have to throw garbage in the garbage? The Flat Earth Corner! Garbage can? What is that? We throw trash on ground, or in cave, wherever. Oh, meat was good. Here, in the Middle Ages, we are proper and civilized. We put our trash in the buckets and then throw it out the window. Whoa! Whoa. Hey! This is a perfectly good banana. Today, we make so much trash that we need transportation systems to get rid of it all so it can go to recycling centers and dumps. People who lived a long time ago didn't have as much stuff, so they didn't make much trash. They could leave junk lying around and their mums didn't complain at all. Archaeologists are scientists who study what life was like a long time ago. When ancient people threw their trash on the ground, the food stuff decomposed but things like broken pots and tools didn't. They got buried in the dirt. So some of what you see in archeology span museums was actually stuff someone threw away. Hey, I found my pot. To find out more, it's time for... My Great Challenge. Okay, today our great challengers are Darcy. What's up? Jake. Whoop, whoop. Caitlin. Whoop. And Kiana. Yeah. Awesome, so you two will be team plastic, and you two are gonna be team paper. It stinks in here. Agreed. It does. Yeah. Good thing I brought yeah. this. Whew. So, you guys are gonna be like archeologists and be doing some work that real archeologists do. Does that sound cool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because today, you get to go through garbage. But don't worry, it's old garbage, and it is from a regular household, and we've taken out all the sharply edged things and all the germy things, so don't worry about that, okay? Okay, because yeah. I'm not really pleasant with the garbage. With the garbage, okay. So your challenge is to figure out, just from looking at the garbage, who lives in the household? It's the science of garbology. Team paper, you guys will be first. Team plastic, you guys can uh, go downstairs and, and see my mom and uh, have some cookies or something. Peace out! <laughs> go! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! This family sure needs to learn to recycle. What do you think this is for? A dog. <laughs> what the? Ra rabbit. Oh, wait, what? Hamster, I don't know. Yeah, hamster. Yeah, hamsters. Hamsters. Um, person. Person. <laughs> this belongs to, like, to a like, woman and a kid. Baby. A hamster, uh, a baby, a toddler. <laughs> toddler. Three, two, one. Okay, time's up. Who do you think this garbage belongs to? I uh, think that it belongs to a little boy. A little boy? That's four and years old. Four years this, old. It's a dog. So they have a dog. And I think this is like their hamster, I think. They have like a hamster. Their hamster wheel. Yeah. A baby boy also. They have a baby boy as well as the four-year-old? Yeah. Okay. And they have a girl. And they have a mom. And a dad. And a dad. Now let's see how Team Plastic does. OK, so Team Plastic, are you ready? Yes. You have two minutes starting now. I am garbage! No! The teams both have the same stuff in their garbage bags. That's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty good stuff. Just something needs to do that much. <laughs> um, OK, I see some stuff. Weird stuff. They own a dog. Hey, an old G.I. Joe thing, I think. It's a G.I. Joe thing. Fruit ring. Hmm, those taste good. A dog bone. Hmm. Baby. Corn chips. Okay. Baby. Baby. Hamster. Yes, hamster. <laughs> Makeup. All right. We don't need makeup, Darcy. Food, 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 food. Three, two, one. Pizza! Okay, stop. Huh? <laughs> who do you think? Eat. Who do you think this garbage belongs to? Um, a family that likes to eat and they're overweighted because of all of the junk. Okay. So who do you think the members of the family are? 
a dog, a hamster, a female woman, a, female a baby, woman. a baby, uh, a and kid, a, and a boy, and a boy, and a, a dad, and a dad. Okay. Mom likes to dress up a lot. <laughs> Mom likes to dress up a lot. Okay, so now I am going to announce the winner. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay, the winner is Team Plastic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> You got the boy right, the baby boy, you had the dog and the hamster, the mom and the dad, and you had their eating habits, like they eat too much junk food, you had that down. And Team Paper said that they had a little girl on top of all those things that you said, and they didn't get the eating habits, so that's why you guys won. <laughs> Team Plastic rules! Thanks for playing my great challenge. You're very welcome. Now for a trashy question from Anthony. Where does toilet water go? Well, Anthony, after you flush, it goes on a long trip and comes out in places like this, so you can swim in it. Gross! But not really. That's just the end of the story. Back to the beginning. I found out that dirty toilet water flows into pipes in your house that lead to giant underground pipes called sewers. The sewers lead to water treatment plants like this one. They remove the poopy sludge, pump oxygen through the leftover water, and use chemicals to get rid of bad bacteria and viruses, and send the now fresh water back into the environment where it came from. And speaking of toilet water, astronauts drink their own pee. It's true. When a rocket goes to space, it has to take all the astronauts drinking water with it, because there aren't any stores in space. Slushy. No, we're not turning back just for that. But when astronauts drink, eventually they have to pee. I told you to go before we left the space station. But most of our pee actually is water. So if astronauts clean it up and turn it back into drinking water, they won't have to pack as much water on the trip. Here's how it works. The astronauts put the pee through a special filter that takes out all the bad stuff. It's like a mini version of the water treatment plant. Mm. Once it's clean to drink, they add a flavored powder. I guess that's to take their minds off the fact that they're drinking a liquid that used to be pee. Now the taste is great, as uh, Gennady's showing you, it's perfectly clear and uh, worth chasing in uh, zero G here. Mmm, lemon. I wonder if this goes in the garbage or the recycling. Speaking of which, did we ever answer Alicia's question? What happens to stuff that goes in the trash? The big answer is... We make a lot of garbage, and it all has to go somewhere. Some of it goes into landfills, recycling centers, or treatment plants. It takes a big team effort to get rid of all of our waste. Kids can do our part by reducing how much stuff we use, reusing stuff instead of throwing it out, and by recycling. Oh, and you'll be glad to know I finally found where that awful smell was coming from. My socks! I thought I'd save water by not washing them, but I think I better put them in the laundry. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Can I have a slushy now? I said no! Hey, guess what all this stuff's for? I've decided to grill my own lunch. An egg salad sandwich with tomatoes and lettuce. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what a farmer's supposed to wear or what a farmer's supposed to use. Anyway, why am I growing my own lunch? To answer Sarah's question. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? Good question. That makes me wonder, where does food come from in the first place? Like, where would I get spaghetti from? A noodle tree? That doesn't sound right. But everything you get from the grocery stores, including junk food, like mm -hmm. chips, donuts, or hot dogs, have to be made from stuff that was grown by a farmer somewhere. <laughs> what would we do if we couldn't get food from grocery stores? Would we grow it ourselves? I'm gonna give it a try. And by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to Sarah's question. But first, Brenna has a question that takes us right back to the beginning of it all. Who invented food? 
berries look delicious, but me not know if they are poison. Ooh, me have idea. What animals and see which berries they eat. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, 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 ah, ah, ooh. Ooh, monkey's eating berries. He seems okay. Now me eat berries. Hmm, now me eat berries are poisonous. But me eat too many. Tummy ache. <laughs> Ancient humans may have figured out what foods were safe to eat by watching animals and copying them. But it wasn't always the best idea because some animals eat things that can make people sick. Then about 8,500 years ago, someone had a crazy idea to collect seeds and plant them in the ground and see if they would grow. And they did. <laughs> I found out it was the very beginning of farming and it changed everything because people didn't have to wander around looking for food. They could start villages. As people discovered how to grow new foods, they started to trade with other villages. Soon, everyone had a lot of different kinds of foods to eat. Now, for my egg salad sandwich, I'll definitely need some eggs. I just have to find some chickens. But first, here's a great chicken question from Vanessa. Why do chickens lay different colored eggs? Because I've seen brown eggs and white eggs. That's a tough egg to crack, Vanessa. But I have some experts who can answer your question. Please welcome chicken farmers, Kate Belgwick and her son, Fletcher. Hey, Zoe, I heard you needed some egg layers for your sandwich. You brought chickens? Hi, chickens. You don't have to eat chicken around me. This is so exciting. Get it? <laughs> exciting. So, do you often lend chickens to people? We do. We actually rent chickens to people who want to have their own freshly laid eggs all summer. This is awesome. Can I name them? Yes, it's okay for you to name them. We let everyone name them. Oh, boy. I'll name that one Molly, uh, that one Princess Pumpernickel, that one Pipsqueak, and that one Cluck. So why do chickens lay different colored eggs? In the beginning, all eggs are white inside the chicken and different breeds will lay down a different color or a pigment in the last few hours before they're laid. These three chickens here lay brown eggs and the chicken over there, she will lay blue eggs. But if you get a cross between the brown egg layers and the blue egg layers, you can get a green egg from them. Green eggs? Is that where green eggs and ham come from? <laughs> So are blue eggs blue inside? <laughs> actually, no, they're all the same inside the shell. So what do they eat? Well, they actually eat this grain food. It's just a mix of grains all crumbled up. So how you feed them is you just get a bit of food and you can sprinkle it on the ground and they'll eventually eat it. How long does it take for them to lay eggs? A couple weeks? No, not even close. They'll all lay one egg a day, starting right away. That means I'm gonna have four eggs today. I hope you like omelets. Four eggs a day? That's 28 eggs a week. And then I'll have 112 eggs a month. And then I'll have 1,344 eggs a year. That means I'll have 672 egg salad sandwiches. Ah, so many sandwiches! Ah! You're gonna make I'm gonna have to get cracking. I'm gonna have to get laying. Thanks for lending me your chickens, guys. I'll take excellent care of them. No problem, Zoe. We know you'll be an exceptional <laughs> chicken handler. <laughs> Clucky, pumpernickel, such beauties. Ask a friend. Hey guys, what are your favorite foods that are made with eggs? Eggs with toast. Hot boiled eggs. An egg sandwich. Egg salad and tuna sandwich. Cake. <laughs> Omelets because they taste really good. Pancakes. I like an over easy. Some bacon on the side. Egg sandwich and egg salad. Egg sandwich, but with like ketchup and uh, broccoli. Hmm, I'll try that. Now, what else do I need for my sandwich beside eggs? Oh yeah, bread. I actually got a question about bread. Where does bread come from? That gives me a great idea for... My Great Challenge! Today we're playing What's That Food Made From? 
Alyssa, Kiara, your team Munch. Yeah. Yay! Daniele, Andrea, your team Crunch. Yeah! Each team will have to match up each of the familiar foods over here on the tables with the plant or animal that they're made from. Over there. Let's pull noodles to see who goes first. Okay, Munch, you guys are going first. Get matching. So, do we take the chocolate first? Um, where did it go? There? Those look yeah, like, I think sort of look like here. cocoa beans. Oh, there. <laughs> That's right. Chocolate is made by roasting the beads from inside this weird looking cocoa plant pod. Team Crunch, go. Team Crunch selected the popcorn, and they're matching it with the corn. And they're right. Heat up dried corn kernels, and they become popcorn. This what? should go. The cinnamon sticks. I think it goes there. Okay. They're matching the cinnamon sticks with the sugar cane. And that's not right. A lollipop. Team Crunch is matching the lollipop with the sugar cane. That's right. Lollipops are mostly made of sugar, which is made by boiling this tall grass called sugar cane. Bread, maybe? Okay. Yeah, it goes yeah. here. Peanut butter should go in. That's right. Peanut butter is made with peanuts, which grows underground on the roots of the peanut plant. Cheese. I'm sure it goes with the cow. <laughs> yeah. That was an easy one. Cheese. Real easy. I think the maple syrup is from a tree. That one or that one? Okay. Maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right. It's right. Maple syrup is made with the sap of the maple tree, which gets boiled down to become thick and sugary. Team Crunch is putting their chocolate in front of the cinnamon tree. Nope. A lollipop. Put it there. And Team Munch also gets the cinnamon tree wrong. Aldaz, here's the answer to your question. Where does bread come from? Both teams put their bread in front of the wheat. And they're right. Wheat seeds are ground up to make flour, which is the main ingredient in bread. Salt, um, maybe. Ocean is salty. Okay, put it there. I think it's wrong. <laughs> Actually, that's right. Most salt comes from ocean water. Sea salt. Peanut butter. Butter, where does that go? It has peanuts. peanuts. Yeah. The cinnamon sticks. Oh, oh no. We should have switched. That's right, because cinnamon is made from the bark of the cinnamon tree. So let's put it here. Mmm, okay. french fries. Um, with the potato. <laughs> That's another easy one. French fries. Popcorn. Pop with corn, because it's like popcorn. It's <laughs> the last thing. And maple syrup, it comes from a tree, so it makes sense. Okay, you guys are done. Too much? You have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! And Team Crunch, you also have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! So it's a tie. Thanks for playing. One man, no no! Now, let's not all let this go to waste. Come on. I want the car. I want the chocolate. Chocolate! I want the pop. Take a good look at that sandwich. Or at that bubble gum. You wonder what they're made of. Where did they come from? We can't have bread without ground up wheat. Gum used to be made with rubber from the tree. Such a chewy treat. See those fish sticks on your plate. They're made from having solar cord. That candy floss is made with yak hair. All balls up into a wad. What? It's made of sugar? Well, if you're ever feeding and wondering what you're eating, come sing this song with me. How was ketchup invented? Who doesn't love ketchup? So I checked, and it's made with squished tomatoes, sugar, vinegar, and it goes with everything. But the first ketchup invented didn't taste anything like this stuff. I found out that it was made from mushrooms, walnuts, oysters, or little fish called anchovies. Yummy. Luckily, a scientist named James Meese introduced tomatoes in his new ketchup recipe, and the rest is history. We make tons of good sauces out of tomatoes, but they didn't always have such a good reputation. <laughs> The deadly and horrible tomato! <laughs> C 
save yourself and your children from this stinky, poisonous devil fruit. It was brought to Europe by foolish travelers. Whatever you do, don't eat them, or you will die a horrible death. Instead, try a safe and healthy fruit, like this apple. For over 200 years, people in Europe were afraid of tomatoes? That was thanks to a British barber, surgeon, and scientist named John Gerard. He described tomatoes as stinking and being poisonous, and everyone believed him. This myth began because people ate tomatoes on plates made of a metal called pewter and got really sick. But it wasn't the tomatoes' fault. There was a poisonous chemical in the pewter called lead that seeped into the tomatoes. It's too bad for so long Europeans were missing out. Imagine spaghetti and meatballs without the tomato sauce. It's just not the same. Uh-oh, do try this at home. You guys are the messiest roommates ever. Look at this place. You know, if we lived in a world without grocery stores, you might think you could get your food directly from farmers. Well, it might not be that easy, because a whole lot of the food we get from grocery stores comes from all around the world. So the next time you're at the store, look close at the label, and it will show you where in the world it comes from. See, this pear says it's from South Africa. That's way down here. This garlic comes from China. And these grapes were grown in Mexico. Check out your fruits and vegetables at home. See which ones are grown close to where you live. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Y'all ain't from around here, are ya? Now, here's a question from Alyssa. Can you grow food in the city? To answer Alyssa's question, I'm meeting Nicholas Taylor, plant science manager who works at a farm. Uh, where's the farm? These are just big old factory buildings. Hey, hey Zoe, Zoe, I'm, I'm up, up here. here. Hey, welcome to Lufa Farms, the world's first commercial rooftop greenhouse. Whoa, you really can grow food in the city. But what is your farm doing on the roof? Good question. What happens is more and more people are filling up all the spaces around the cities and we're running out of land. What we did was rather than to have a farm outside the city far away where we'd have to bring the food in, we brought the farm right into the city. Now, because there's so many buildings, they decided to use areas that were not being used by the people, which is on top of the roofs. What's cool about being on top of a roof is that you capture all that sun that would normally be hitting the roof, but now it's hitting the cucumbers and helping them grow. Here's one of our uh, Lebanese cucumbers. Want to try it? You mean pick it off the tree? Yeah, go for it. Without washing it? You don't have to. We don't use any synthetic pesticides here. Oh, no poisonous chemicals to kill the bugs? Cool. That's really good. When you grow veggies really close to where the people are picking it up, you can pick it as fresh as possible. So it's super good and packed with nutrients. So when food has to travel a long time to get here, it loses its flavor. Absolutely. And Nicholas tells me that when food travels far to get to us, a lot of it spoils and is wasted. And also that transporting it means burning a lot of fuel. That causes pollution. Hey, can I help you plant something? Want to plant some lettuce? Sure. All right, let's do it. So we're going to be planting some butterhead lettuce. They're probably getting a little angry sitting in this tray because we probably should have planted them a couple days ago. So what's cool about this system is that we can grow a lot of lettuce really close together super efficiently. Look, a little bug. That reminds me of a question that I got from Amber. Is bug poison on plants bad for people? In farms, people can use a lot of bug poison in the form of pesticides. And it has been shown to be kind of rough for people, which is why most people will suggest that you always wash your fruits and veggies. 
but we don't use any synthetic pesticides here. So we fight bugs with bugs. Right here in front of us, we have a lot of bad guy bugs called aphids. They're eating our peppers. One aphid in about one day can make 10 more aphids. And then those 10 make 10, and then those 10 make another 10, <laughs> and then the plant is just completely covered. So what we use to fight these bugs is more bugs. What? In this case, Whoa, ladybugs. ladybugs. That's right. <laughs> but these guys, they're not gonna harm us. They're not interested in me at all. If anything, <laughs> if anything they're probably confused about my arm hair. Whoa. So they're gonna crawl around and they're gonna look for these aphids on these leaves. It tickles. <laughs> Ladybug, high five. Go. Are you ready? No, I'm good. No, you're gonna squish them. <laughs> so all these guys are gonna hang out here <laughs> because this is the best place in town for ladybugs. Yeah, cause they eat the aphids. It's eating one now. That's right, but they don't just eat aphids. They eat all sorts of other little pests. They're kind of like the big boss compared to all the other bugs. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. They're so small. They don't have a tough name, yeah. but they're one of the toughest species we have. Hey, you wanna put that out? Sure. That's it, perfect. Good job, little ladybug. This is a sweet pepper. Wanna pick it? Sure. <laughs> there you go. Vegetables you can eat the same day they were picked. From a farm in the city on a rooftop. Thanks, Nicholas. This is so exciting. I have fresh vegetables now, and with the eggs from the chicken, my lunch is really starting to come together. But you don't have to get someone else to grow your veggies. You can grow them yourself by planting seeds in your backyard garden or in window boxes. You can even grow new veggies from old leftovers. My friends tried it out. The experiment! Andalane and Vivian found out that you can grow fresh vegetables from kitchen scraps like these. What are you doing? I'm gonna try and put this piece of celery in water and see what happens. You take the bottom part from a celery bunch and sit it in some warm water in the sun. Let's wait a couple of weeks and see what happens. Okay. It grows new leaves. Take the sprouting celery and plant it in some earth. Try taking the seeds from inside a pepper plant. Plant them in soil and give them a little bit of water. Put your pots in the sun and wait for a couple of weeks. Look it up. You can do this with many kinds of veggies. I can't believe this worked. I know. So there you go. Plant your table scraps and have your own indoor mini farm. Now that's local produce. Bye, Zoe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> These veggies have had some time to grow. And look at them now. Looks like I can add some celery to my egg salad. That means I have everything I need to make a sandwich. And I can finally answer the question that started off the show. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? The big answer is... We can grow it ourselves or buy it from local farmers. In fact, it looks like we'll be doing this more and more in the future. Growing food close to home can help avoid some big problems, like waste, poisonous pesticides, and air pollution. Plus, the food is healthier and tastes way better. That rooftop farm I visited is just one amazing way to grow food in the city. There are kids planting gardens in their school yards, and community food gardens are popping up all over the place. People have even turned swimming pools into fish farms. It's amazing what you can grow if you get creative. Now all I have to do is make my sandwich. Well, I forgot to grow wheat to make bread. Good thing my mom picked up a loaf of bread from the local farmer's market. That still kind of counts, right? This is the best homegrown sandwich I've ever eaten. Princess Buffernickel, Clucky, your eggs are delicious. Great job, guys. Thanks, Sally. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, where I answer your big questions. Like, what is all this stuff? Stick around and you'll find out, because by the end of the show, I promise there'll be an explosive finish. Now, I always start the show with one of your questions, so here's the first one. 
What will happen if someone cracks the earth? The short answer is mass destruction, disaster, chaos, the release of giant radioactive monsters. But seriously, if there are underground monsters waiting to escape, I want to know about them. So by the end of today's show, I'll find out what would happen if someone cracked the Earth. Here's a question from Jaden. What I want to know is how does an earthquake happen? Well, there isn't an earthquake happening here at the moment, but I do know where to find out about them. My good friend and roving reporter Sydney is at the Science Center. The Sydney Report. Thanks, Harrison. Today I'm with Julie Jones, the earthquake expert. How does an earthquake happen? That's a great question. The Earth is a bit like an orange. Inside the orange is liquidy and juicy. Inside the Earth is liquid rock. It's hot. Now, on the outside of the Earth, there's a crust. Just like on the outside of the orange, we have a peel. But they're in plates. And so I've kind of shown here that we've taken the uh, orange open. And when those sh plates shift and move, that's when we get earthquakes. Julie told me that where tectonic plates meet, that's where earthquakes and volcanoes happen. Like here, around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. There are so many earthquakes and volcanoes there that it's called the Ring of Fire. This map shows the number of earthquakes that have happened in the last 30 days. Wow, there's a lot. Julie tells me they use something called the Richter scale to measure their energy. The actual scale ranges from zero to 10. Now, we've never had a 10. That's incredibly a, a massive earthquake. But anything less than a two, we don't really notice at all. Uh, something from like a two to a three and a half or a four, you're gonna notice the, the earth, you know, that's gonna move a little bit. Maybe some of the, the china in your cabinet that's a little close together is gonna rattle. You might see some liquid moving in a fishbowl, but it's still a fairly small earthquake. But once you get into the fours and the fives and the sixes, then the building starts to shake. And once a building starts to shake, there can be damage in a building. And once you get up to something that's a magnitude nine, well, those are some of the biggest earthquakes we've ever had. And those are incredible. The whole building just wobbles back and forth. They collapse, we have tsunamis. All of those things go with a nine. Right, so when the surface of the earth moves, the buildings move. And we try and make our buildings safe by building them using certain techniques. Here we have two distinct buildings. One is a very standard building, the other one is actually on a base that shifts back and forth, so that when the Earth shifts, in theory, it doesn't move around as much, making it a safer building to be in. You've got some handles, give the table a shake. Oh, I see. So this one moves with the Earth, whereas this one just shakes back and forth. Yeah. Now, we just discovered that the, this building will uh, be the safer building to be in, so clearly it will survive a stronger earthquake than this one. I also read that diagonal crossways for a building would make it more stable. Does that mean that if I were building out of Lego or Connects, if I made my base of my house with diagonal crossed bars, that would make it stronger than just straight? Yes, if you're working in Connects, triangle shapes are the strongest shapes. So if you incorporate those with like a diagonal to an X across a square, that's going to be a stronger building. But what about something like a road? What would happen to a road? The plates go over top. So when it shifts, the road goes up, the surface goes up. Now, this is a big earthquake. So, Sydney, you had asked me about the Richter scale and how we measure um, earthquakes. This is a seismometer. Let's give it a demo. Why don't you give us a stomp, make okay. the earth shake if you can, and we'll see how it measures up. Not too bad, it's a lip. I made a blip. <laughs> made a blip. So the, you can imagine the, the more you've shifted the Earth, the greater the energy, the higher the magnitude. Oh no, what have I done? Whoa! Sorry about that, Whoa! Harrison. Hang Whoa! on. Whoa! Whoa! Just kidding. But imagine if tectonic plates had to explain to their mom who made this big mess. <laughs> It's 
not my fault the earth went crack. He pushed me, so I pushed him back. It's not my fault this seismic rift. rift. Pacific plate, he started it. When plate pushes plate, you get an earthquake. When plate pushes plate, you get an earthquake. Now here's a question from Rianne. How can they predict the weather, but they can't predict earthquakes? Actually, Rianne, even weather forecasts are only accurate seven times out of 10. There are so many forces involved in creating an earthquake that scientists still haven't figured out how to predict them yet. Uh-oh, do try this at home. If you're in an earthquake, you have to get away from anything that might fall on you. Even on a desert island. So what if the Earth started shaking right now, like this? You feel that? It's a tremor. Where do you go? What do you do? So the best place to be during an earthquake is outside, away from buildings, trees, and power lines. But, of course, you can't predict where you're going to be when there's an earthquake. Ugh. So during an earthquake, it's best to be under a sturdy table like this because it protects you from anything that falls. Ah, another great place is to sit under a door frame because the frame protects you from things that fall. Whew. But you're not really likely to feel one unless you live near a fault line. This is a picture of the San Andreas Fault in California, where the Pacific Plate meets the North American Plate. The movement of the plates is slowly pulling California apart. Eventually, Los Angeles will slide past San Francisco in about 20 million years. So while we're waiting for that to happen, let's take a question from Atom, who wants to find out. How does lava get created inside volcanoes? <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner! So how does lava get created inside volcanoes? Well, here in ancient Rome, we've got that figured out. The god Vulcan has a blacksmith's forge in there. And Vulcan, volcano, get it? <laughs> it's so funny because I made a joke and it was a funny one. <laughs> Silly Romans, I am Rene Descartes. Here in the Renaissance, we admire the Romans, but instead of superstition, we have science. Through observation and deductive reasoning, I have concluded that volcanoes are created by the sun burning holes into the earth and allowing lava to escape. Makes sense, no? Descartes was a mathematical genius, but his explanation about volcanoes didn't make any more sense than the Romans. To find out how lava is created, please welcome a real volcanologist, Professor John Stix. Hi. How are you doing, Harrison? Welcome to my show. Well, thanks for having me. So can you tell me how lava is created? This little can is going to tell us something about how volcanoes work. A can of mixed nuts? Yep. I think I know what's coming, but I'll bite. Are you saying that snakes make lava? Well, not exactly, wise guy. The experiment! How is a snake like lava? Okay, so that's a, a good experiment that shows that when pressure is released, mm -hmm. a volcanic eruption happens. What happens is the magma breaks, then you get lava. Magma is the melted rock and metal under the Earth's crust. It turns into lava once it reaches the surface of the Earth, like when it comes out of a volcano. So what do you have here? It's a can of soda. We'll pop this one open, slowly, and we'll fill up this baby bottle. Okay, soda pop is actually a great analog for a, a volcanic eruption and a volcano. Because what's happening is that you're releasing pressure, and when the pressure is released, bubbles come out. Oh, whoa. It's filling up. <laughs> So that's exactly what happened there. The bubbles the came out air. and the pressure built up pressure. in the volcano. This is our volcano. So now it's time for another question. What would happen if volcanoes were everywhere? 
Yeah, what would happen? Would it be like my scene of destruction earlier? Yeah, it would be a mess, but it actually doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there are most volcanoes are, are actually not erupting right now. They're fairly quiet. Oh, okay. And some volcanoes, after a few months or a few years, start start to uh, get active, and they and they go into a eruption, and they might erupt for a few months or years, but then they quiet down. There are a couple of volcanoes that are always erupting, but these are pretty small volcanoes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then let's take another question. This one's from Melissa. Does lava turn into a special rock when it hardens? Okay, so think about uh, lava. We see pictures of lava flowing uh, in places mm -hmm. like Hawaii, for example. Yeah. Okay, so it can come out as lava, but it can come out as ash, too, during an explosive eruption. So here is one volcanic rock. You can hold that. It's okay, so like it was like polished, sort of. Yeah, it's actually glass. It's called oh, okay. obsidian, and it has cooled really, really fast, just like glass does. That's really cool. Let's look at another one. Okay, so here's a piece of pumice. Yes, I've heard of this. Yeah, okay, so pumice is material that's been erupted out of the volcano, but the reason it's so light is that it's full of gas bubbles from all the gas, just like our can, okay? Same, same, same idea, full of gas bubbles that came out of the magma as it was erupted. Do you think this is heavy? Probably. It's not actually that heavy. No, you're just going to show okay, it. Yeah. Okay. So inside this rock, this is a great rock. Yeah. So this is called a volcanic bomb. And inside the rock, it's full of bubbles, okay? It and on the outside, like this, like it cooled faster than inside. Really? So it's full of cracks. Yes, See yeah. all these are the cracks? Oh yeah, all these things. Yeah. And then oh. inside here, if we dropped it, which I'm not going to do, <laughs> if we dropped it, we it would, would see tons of bubbles. It would look something like that, that. inside? Yep. It, it would split open, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do one more thing. Okay. So let's think about magma flowing in a conduit before it gets, before it erupts, okay? okay. Flowing through the throat of the volcano. Mm -hmm. So here's the magma right here. It's actually sort of silly putty. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the magma flow slowly first. Okay, so, okay, so just, just pull slowly. Okay. Okay, here's, so here's slowly flowing magma. Okay, no problem. Lava comes out and so forth. Okay, perfect. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, for some reason, maybe because there's a lot of gas in the system, mm -hmm. the stuff, instead of flowing slowly, it's flowing fast. One, two, three. Okay? Oh, it so it didn't right flow. It, it, it didn't flow. It actually mm -hmm. broke. So it can come out as big pieces, one big piece, one big piece, one very big piece. Oh, yeah, but it can also ones. come out as ash. So these oh. are very small pieces. So that's how you get all these cool shapes I found. Okay, so this is uh, a picture of the Giant's Causeway mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. And it's showing a series of lava flows. And the columns, you, they're actually called columnar joints. Okay. And it's caused by the cooling of the lava. This other picture is a picture of the Hawaiian Islands. I think it's a very great place to look for lava flows. You can see okay. wonderful lava flows actually in the process of forming and flowing and actually flowing into the ocean sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is an example of a lava tube. Oh, and a lava tube is basically just as it sounds, lava flowing through a tube. Mm -hmm. And one reason it's able to flow in the tube is because the tube insulates the, the lava. So it stays hot, it's able to flow, and it's actually able to flow sometimes very long, long distances. Okay, so now what are we doing over here? Okay, we're gonna look at two pieces of volcanic rock. Okay, so... Pick up the first one. This one. So people actually use that for their barbecues. Uh, it has a bunch of holes. Yeah, and... throw it in the water now. Okay. Okay, so that sinks. It just sank right Most away. volcanic rocks sink. Yeah. Throw that one in the water. Okay, so this one, it floats. It's got so many bubbles, it's super light, less dense than water, so it actually floats. And this is from a highly explosive volcanic eruption. So maybe it's the only rock that floats? Yeah, I think it, I think it is the only rock that floats. That's exactly wow. right. So thanks for helping me find stuff out. Can you come back later for the big finale? I wouldn't miss it. Awesome. Amazing, isn't it? Volcanoes make you think of destruction and ruin, but there are a lot of positive things that come out of them too, like soap. Besides that, volcano stuff is also made into blades that eye doctors use to perform delicate surgery. It's in the cement used to build our homes and schools, and in fertilizers that help to grow our food. Let's take another question. This one's from Sam. My question is, What's the temperature inside of a volcano? The temperature inside of a volcano? Okay, let's take a look. 
The temperature inside of my house is about 20 degrees. And we know a volcano is hotter than that. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but rock melts much hotter than that. Our oven can bake stuff at 220 degrees. But I don't think rock can melt in it. Maybe if we use 16 ovens, 220 times 16, probably close to the temperature of my brain right now, which is hot enough to... You're gonna make my head explode. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that the inside of a volcano is really hot. But to get a more precise answer, I'm gonna go over to Sydney at the Science Center. Over to you, Sydney. Thank you, Harrison. Now we're gonna meet George Karunas. Speaking of which, where is he? What is that? <laughs> Hi, Sydney. How are you? I'm pretty good, getting kind of warm in here. <laughs> what is this? This is my volcano heat suit. It's a specially designed wow. suit that allows me to not only get close to volcanoes, but right up to the lava. So you've been into real volcanoes with this? Several times, yeah, it's what I that do. That is so cool. I explore erupting volcanoes. It must have been really hot though. Exactly, and that's why I wear the suit. Lava can be 2,000 degrees. Now imagine if you're baking a cake at home, that's only 350 degrees. So if lava were to cover your car, it would melt. It's, it's hot enough to melt rock. I've been in a situation where I've had lava in my hand, like a hot potato, it's Ooh. so hot. So you must have been in there very short periods of time, otherwise this you might even burn. Exactly, it will protect me, but not for a long time. I'll put on the suit, I'll get into the volcano, close to the lava, maybe for a few minutes to grab a sample, take some photos, and then out. So how does a volcano work? Well, I've got a simulation right here and I can show you. Hit the button. Okay. So the volcano is <gasps> one of the biggest kinds. Yes, and when they have a huge eruption, look at that. rocks can go flying for kilometers out of the volcano. <gasps> and look at the streaks of ash with the rocks. Yep. Tremendous Flying amounts up. of ash that can bury cities oh and spread more than halfway around the world. It's almost like an avalanche of ash. That's exactly what it is. That's a pyroclastic flow. It is an avalanche of ash and hot gas pouring down the side of the mountain. Pompeii is a city in Italy that was completely buried by ash in 79 AD, a long time ago. And they were actually able to excavate, find the city underneath, and they actually found the shell of people that were buried by the volcano 2,000 years ago. The shell? By digging down, they were able to find empty spaces in the piles of ash where people used to be. Oh. They filled those holes with plaster, and when they took away all the ash, they found the shape of human beings. Whoa. It's really amazing to see. The power of a, vol of a volcano, it's like a gigantic bomb going off. If the city was at the bottom of the volcano, mm -hmm. could any people run away and escape before it came in? Depends on the size of, of the volcanic eruption. A big eruption, like the one that we just simulated here, you would have pretty much no chance of running. How does that suit protect you then? Well, let me show you. Come on. All right, I'm gonna show you exactly how this suit protects me from a volcano's heat. I got my friend Mark here. He's gonna breathe fire on me. Stand back. Cool. I'm not sure what they're about to do, but whatever it is, do not try it at home. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, that was amazing! Woohoo! That was great! Thank you guys so much for joining us. Back to you, host Harrison. What a coincidence! That's how my grandma bakes her cookies! Thanks, Sydney! And now it's time to go to the question that started this investigation. What will happen if someone cracks the earth? The big answer is... Nothing new! The earth already is cracked, and it's still cracking and shifting as we speak. Along with that, we get new mountains, new islands, and we have to live with occasional earthquakes and volcanoes. Which unfortunately, we can't predict. But here's something we can predict. At the beginning of the show, I promised you a huge eruption, and here it is. So here I am back at my school's loading dock, which they have let me use for this demonstration. And Professor Sticks has come to help me out. Yeah, Harrison, we're gonna make a 
an explosive eruption, we're gonna shake up these cans and we're gonna simulate a volcanic eruption on okay. three. Ready? Okay. One, One, two, two three. three. <laughs> All right, not bad. So that was fun, but it wasn't that explosive finish that you've been waiting for. Right, Professor? Yeah, I think we can do better. Yeah. Wait, what's the first thing you do when a volcano erupts? Uh, run? As fast as you can. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out! I had the best day ever, Kiona. I aced my math test, and it was pizza day in the cafeteria. Kiona understands me because she's the smartest, the bestest, and the cutest dog in the world. Yes, you are. I'm wondering the same thing as Leah. Do humans really understand dogs? Hmm, I'm really not sure. But I'll find out by the end of the show. Maybe if I understood Keon a little bit better, I could teach her new tricks. <gasps> roll over. No, roll over, not stay, roll. Well, I have the same question as Soham. How do you get a dog to do whatever you want? I found the perfect place to find an answer, Soham. There's a dog training camp where kids can learn how to get their dogs to do super cool tricks. I'm gonna meet Antoine and his dog, Caramel, Noah and Bodie, and Cecile and Bella. Mary and the dog trainer will be there too. I know exactly what Kiana would say about going to camp. Camp? Roasted marshmallows? Swimming in the lake? Oh yeah! <laughs> it's not that kind of camp, but it'll be just as fun. <laughs> wow, Antoine's dog knows how to sit. He gives his paw. Wow, and he lies down on command. If Kiona learned tricks like that, she'd be a superstar at the dog park. Please, no selfies. If I have to do one, I have to do a hundred. How do you make your dog do tricks like that? You have to build up trust with your dog. The tunnel trick is a good way to start. Let's do it, Kiona. You go through the tunnel first to show your dog. Hold out a treat and tell her to come. Okay. Thank you. Kiki, come. Come here. Come here. Come here. Good girl. Very good. So when Kiona saw me go through the tunnel, she knew it was okay for her to do it too? Yeah. You build up trust with her. Do you always use treats as rewards? Not just treats. We can also use toys because dogs love to play. Even grown-up dogs love to play. So playtime is a great reward and it builds up the friendship between you and your dog. BFFs. Playing is the best part. But how do you teach a dog to sit? I'll show you. First, you throw a treat, then, you let her know you have another one. You close your hand, put it on your chest, and say sit. And then you reward her. Let me give it a try. Kiki, look what I have. Okay, come here. Sit. Good girl! The reason you raise your hand up to your chest is because she looks up at it, and it kind of makes her sit naturally. Good girl! And always make sure you give her lots of praise after she does a trick or learns something. Good girl! Dogs know by the sound of your voice if you're rewarding them or scolding them. You want to teach Kiona how to do a double high five? Yeah, sure! First, you show her you have a treat. Then, you put it in your hand, put your hands up, and say high five. I see! It makes her put her paws into the right spot for a high five. Good boy. Then you reward them. Okay, ready? High five. Good girl. Hey, Zoe, do you know the right way to hold a leash? Just hold on and don't let go? Not exactly. Put your right hand in the loop and hold on. With your left hand, lower down the leash, hold on tight. Like that? Yeah. And the most important part of walking your dog is the poo bag. Yep, I always have poo bags with me. You poop, I scoop. Boop, boop, be doop. Dog poop makes me think of dog butts. And this question from Jonah. Why do dogs sniff each other's butts? Hi, Marianne. Hi, Zoe. 
So you train dogs, so you probably see dogs sniff each other's butt all the time. Why do they do that? Well, dogs sniff each other's butt to say hello. It's kind of their way of saying hi, and they get a lot of information about each other by doing that. Well, hello there. Nice to meet you. Woo -woo. The side of a dog's butt have glands that secretes odors and chemicals. Other dogs can learn a lot from it, their age, their health, what they ate, and even how they're feeling. Kind of like the dog version of shaking hands or hugging. Yeah, so dogs often are gonna go smell your shoes, smell your coat, and they're getting the same information, but about us this time. It helps them understand us. Now that I know that, it helps me understand them. Yeah, and also they understand your body language. Watch, I'll point and Rudy will follow. Yes, good girl. <laughs> Thanks for helping me understand more about dogs, everyone. You're welcome. Me and Kiona are gonna keep learning new tricks. We are? Usman has a question about how dogs manage to figure out something really special. How do dogs know where to go when their owner is blind? Dogs can do all kinds of jobs. You train them and they get rewards, like playtime. That's a reward, isn't it? Yes, it is. But if you have a dog for a blind person, I found out they get special training. They're called guide dogs. They learn to stop at curbs and follow orders. If there's danger, like the sound of traffic at a crossroad, the dog won't move until it's safe. The dog owner tells the dog when to turn and it's up to the dog to stay away from danger. I found out that there are also specially trained dogs for kids with autism, which is something some kids are born with but not all autistic kids are the same, just like I'm not the same as all of my friends. I invited someone who can help me find out more about her special dog. Please welcome to today's show, Taylor Passmore and her dog, Solo. Hi, Taylor. Hey, Zoe, how's it going? Good. Hi, Solo. So what's so special about Solo? She's actually one of the first autistic service dogs, and these dogs have not been around for a very long time. So, how does Solo help you? I suffer from ADHD and autism, so I get super stressed out. And for people that don't suffer from autism, it's perfectly fine, but for me, it's really hard for me to work. Just a simple math test, I just get so stressed out. When Solo's with me, just knowing that she's there helps me, but in case I just get too stressed out, I just give her a little cuddle, as if it's just me and her in the room. So how do kids in your class react? Even the teacher says it just makes everyone feel calm. Have a look. It's fun to have her in a class, and it's funny when we're reading and she just snores. Sometimes we have to tap Taylor on the shoulder and get her to wake Solo up. We're really lucky to have Solo, because like when we were doing our exams, we were like all stressed out, but sometimes we'll look at Solo and like the stress will go away. Yeah, like you see Solo, then you're like, oh. Well, you can't really interact with the dog because it's working, and we can't touch her when she has her harness on. So why can't they pet Solo? Well, it would just basically be really hard for her to concentrate if everyone's just petting her left and right. It, it, she wouldn't be knowing help, who to help, and she would just get super confused. So when the harness is on, she knows it's work? Yes, and as soon as I take it off, she's like any other house dog. And she's still a little puppy, so she would just be running around crazy. So do you take Solo everywhere? I could take Solo anywhere. We go to restaurants, movie theaters, airports, malls, practically anywhere. I'm always with her. We're a team. She even sleeps in my bed with me. Before I got her, I was just so stressed out, but just knowing that she's there just makes me feel a lot calmer. She's my best friend. Well, thanks, Taylor and Solo, for helping me find stuff out. It was no trouble at all. <laughs> Looks like my dog, Kiona's having her afternoon nap. <laughs> That reminds me of a question I got from Michael. Do dogs dream? I've seen Kiona twitching. She twitches her ears, her eyes, even her legs when she's sleeping. So I think she's dreaming. It looks like scientists think so too. They found out that a dog's brain and a human's brain work a bit the same during sleep time. So they're pretty sure that just like us, dogs have dreams. But what do they dream about? I can answer that in a song. I'm dreaming doggy dreams. I'm chasing the sunbeams. This is my doggy dream. I'm chilling in stream. I am the 
boss of the town where there's lots of frisbees and squirrels and super doggy love. If you see me twitching, it's because I'm itching to play in my dreams, to be the dog supreme. It's my adventure. I am the inventor of my doggy fun time zone. Give this dog a bone. I'm dreaming dog of dreams. 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 Dogs probably sniff everything in their dreams. <laughs> Kiona often smells things that I don't even see. How can dogs smell things we can't smell? I found out that smell is the main way dogs download information about the world around them. And their nose has about 300 million smell receptors that help them sift things out. Hey, people only have about 6 million. Scientists think that dogs can smell 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people. What? My sense of smell times 100,000? A skunk smell would knock me out! The trash can stink would be unbelievable! I also found out dogs can use their powerful sense of smell to do amazing stuff. They use their nose to know which direction to go when looking for missing people. The first footprints have less smell than the next ones, so the dog knows which way the person went. They can also be trained to find people under rubble after an earthquake, and to sniff out bombs, money, and even bed bugs. <laughs> And that gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today's challengers are Emma and Isla on Team Smell Hunters. <laughs> and Usman and Audra on Team Sniff Detectives. <laughs> Think you can sniff things as well as dogs can? Yeah. Yes, no. Yes, no. <laughs> well, that's your challenge. You're going to take a big whiff of this box, and you have to go out and find the matching one that I've hidden and bring it back here. <laughs> Ew. There you go. Okay. Ready? Set. Go! <laughs> I put all kinds of smelly things in those boxes. Can they remember the first one I made them sniff? It was chicken poop. I Blech. found one, come. No. 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 No, this smells like nail polish. Oh, I found one. Ew, I, I found it, I found it. Let's see if you guys are right. Found one, found it. Oh, you guys are right. Yes! <laughs> Is this right? I don't know. No, it's this one. <laughs> you guys got it. Okay. Time for the second challenge. Guess that smell. You have to smell each of the eight boxes, and then you have to match the pictures with the boxes that you smell. Team Smell Hunters, go! Oh, it smells like coffee. It's coffee. Coffee? It's coffee. Okay. Oh, nail polish, nail polish. Next one. It smells like fish. You think it's fish? Yeah, fish. Okay. Poop. <laughs> nope. Yeah, it's poop. It's poop! Yeah, it's poop. Emma knows poop when she smells it. Lavender. Lavender? Yeah. It's something gross. Cheese. Cheese? Mustard. Mustard? Mustard. Obviously mint. <laughs> yeah. That smells like... A mint candy, not the actual mint. Okay, now it's Sniff Detective's turn. Okay, guys, go. Chicken poop. Looks like we've got another poop smell expert. Um, mint. Lavender. Lavender. Okay. Nail polish remover. Nail polish remover. Exactly. Fish. Fish? Okay. Fish. Fish. <laughs> what do you think it is? Mint. Obviously. Cheese. Coffee. 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 Yep. yep. Mustard. <laughs> yeah. Everyone could smell mustard. So, small hunters, you got all of these right. And so did sniff detectives. But because we're counting the first round as well, the grand winner is Smell Hunters! Good job, guys! <laughs> 
Now here's another great question. What happens if a dog with rabies bites you? A flat Earth corner. Oh no! Not again! The bite from the dog with rabies has drawn me to a life of hairiness and howling. Upon every full moon. I transform into a hideous werewolf, creeping through the dark until daylight appears. It's like totally exhausting. <laughs> In ancient times, that's what some people believed. But there's no proof werewolves exist. Rabies, on the other hand, is a serious sickness. It's a virus like the chickenpox or the flu, except it affects the brain and spine. Dogs and other animals can get rabies, and if one of them bites you, it can make you pretty sick. That's why we give our pets vaccines against rabies. Luckily, we have medicine. So if you do get bitten, you won't turn into a werewolf. Ah! Phew. <laughs> I wonder what Kiona thinks that is. I wish I could speak dog so we can understand each other. Hello! What's so hard to understand? Woof, woof, woof. I love my dog. Melina has a question about how many kinds there are. How many types of dogs are there? He's a dog show judge and he knows a lot about the kinds of dogs and how many we've got. Please welcome James Reynolds. Come on, Kiki. Hi, James. Hi, Zoe. Meet Kiona. You can meet Roulette. Hi, Roulette. Kiona is a Shiba Inu. Yeah. And Roulette is a bloodhound. You know, we have over 600 different kinds of dogs. But why are they all so different? Because they're all for different purposes. The bloodhound is a scent hound. It hunts by smell. It's used usually to find lost people. And it has other traits that help it. For instance, lift one of the legs. See how big it is? That lets her go through trees and grass trying to find the person she's looking for. Check the skin. See how loose it is? Yeah. That means she isn't going to get scraped and scratched. Her skin's going to move and let her go through. But her secret part is this part. This loose skin, the cheeks and the over brow, and the ears, when she goes forward, it directs the scent up into the nose. And so she can find anybody. Kind of like hide and seek. A good game of hide and seek, <laughs> yes. Hi, Allison Andrew. Hi. What's your dog's name? Our dog's name is Elsie. Elsie. She's a deer, deer hound. This is one of my very favorite breeds of dogs, a Scottish deer hound. It was bred in Scotland to hunt deer. Notice there's a lot of muscle there because what can she do with that? She can run very fast. That's right. The hindquarters are like springs. And when she runs into something um, lying on the ground? She jumps. She really likes playing with us. And I like playing with her because it's really fun. And she's really funny. If she hears something or smells something, like one ear will go up and she'll look around <laughs> to see what's around her. Hi, Arthur. What's your dog's name? His name's Spencer. It's a cardigan corgi. These are dogs that were bred to actually help herd animals, cows and sheep. However, if you think about the height of a cow and the height of this, you think, well, how does that make any sense? <laughs> it makes sense because he will nip at the heels of the cow as he's chasing it. And so they will herd the cattle and move them along. He's cute, he's fluffy and sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Hi. What's your dog's name? Felicia. The black coat retriever is supposed to go into the water and find ducks and geese, or on land and find a partridge or a grouse or a pheasant. They're very, very friendly. They will, however, when you're out, suddenly take off if they see a squirrel. <laughs> she never has her tongue in her mouth. <laughs> so, what's your dog's name? It's Billy. Billy? It's a Pekingese. They were bred by the royal family in ancient China, and only they were allowed to own them. So fluffy. Billy really seems to like you a lot. And they're supposed to have a very short nose and a very wide face. So this dog has won many prizes. Along with being, as you can see, a very friendly, nice dog just to know. <laughs> You're so sweet. You have a new fan. <laughs> Hi, Chloe. Hi. This is Leo. Hi, Leo. He's a full breed chihuahua. 
And this is what we call a toy dog. They come from the toy group of dogs, and they're meant to be companion dogs. And they're very affectionate, and I take it he is a very good pet. Yeah. He always seems happy and always wants to play. He never loses energy. <laughs> And my dog, Kion, is a Shiba Inu. So the Shiba is very old. It's been a breed for many thousands of years. So dogs and humans have been friends for a really long time. Probably 30,000 years since that first person went and found a wolf cub, brought it into the human group, and then it became useful to them, and it was used for hunting or for pulling things, such as in the north, pulling the dog sled, but most importantly, as a companion. Well, thanks, James, for helping me find stuff out. My pleasure. It's always good to see people having fun with dogs. <laughs> dogs are a lot of fun. I understand them a lot better now, too. Hey, that means you can answer Leah's big question. Ruff, ruff. Do humans really understand dogs? Well, Leah, the big answer is... Yes, we can. Once we understand why dogs do the things they do, we can understand them a lot better. Just like they can understand us by how our voice sounds and how our shoes smell. I don't need to be able to speak dog to understand what Kiana's trying to tell me. She wants to play. Don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I'm really excited about today's show because your questions gave me an excuse to come to this racetrack and do a lot of fun stuff. Like this. Okay, so I'm actually in the passenger seat, but it's a lot of fun too. I'm here with high performance driving instructor, Hagen Hone. And today I'm answering all your questions about cars, including this one from Haley. Is a Ferrari faster than a cheetah? Meow. Well, a Ferrari is a really, really fast type of sports car, but I wonder if it's faster than a cheetah. I really hope it is because this cheetah that I got to help answer your question has a lot of attitude, so I might have to get out of here in a hurry. So let's go. So Haley, I don't know the answer to that question, but we'll find out at the end of the show when I go head to head with a cheetah in Hagen's Ferrari. Here's the next question. What was the first car? Well, Artyom, I checked, and the first cars were nothing like the cars today. The first automobile that we know for sure existed was built over 250 years ago and designed by a French engineer named Nicolas Cugnot. It had a huge boiler on the front like a pot and ran on steam power. It had a top speed of a whopping three kilometers an hour. That's only this fast. I wouldn't want to try to get away from a cheetah at this speed. The first car that looked anything like a car we'd recognize was built in 1885 by Carl Benz, a German inventor. It was the first car to run on a gasoline engine, just like the ones most cars run on today. That's easy to catch. Here's the next question. Why do cars crash? To find out how cars crash and how not to crash them, I'm back at the racetrack with Hog and Hone. Hey, so how do cars crash? The biggest cause of crashes is lack of driver attention. They're eating, they're talking on the phone, having fun with their friends. So are we going to put this to the test? Oh, we're going to do more than that. We're going to practice. So we're going to crash? No, we're not crashing. It's my Ferrari. I'm going home with my Ferrari. <laughs> this is a special track. There's nothing to crash into. You can drive. Really? You trust me not to crash your Ferrari? No, but I'm going to be in the car with you at all times. OK, let's go. Cool. I get to drive a Ferrari. Only one problem. I don't know how to drive. Let the clutch out. Keep letting the clutch out. Slowly, smoothly. A little bit more. Got another inch to go. There That's we go. It. Here we go. More gas, more gas, give her more gas. Clutch out. And we're on our way. After about an hour of practicing, I think I've got the hang of it. So we're here at a racetrack because it gives us a lot of extra safety. And luckily, we are on a dry day right now. Dry day has given us lots of extra grip, so we're less likely to lose control as if it was snowing or rain. Yeah. Rain, for example, you can lose 80% of your grip uh, for cornering and braking in the rain. Wow. Hagen says that another reason for accidents is driving too fast, because when you go fast, it's harder to slow down. 
I'm gonna show you by practicing emergency braking. So 60 kilometers an hour, yep. and then I'm so stopping at the yellow line. Yep, I'm gonna feed the gas a little bit more, that's it, release the clutch, nice and slowly, smoothly. Feed the gas, release the clutch. Excellent, build up some speed, clutch in, shift, clutch out, gas, that's it. So now build it up to 60 and I'm hold at it at 60. 60. Right now. Get ready, hammer it, break. There's 60, I easily stopped pretty fast, actually. Wow, so that's not even that bad. But let's try it at 100 now. Let's see if I can stop as fast when I'm going at a higher speed. Now the fun begins. Let's see how fast 100 is. That's it, hold it right there. 100 right now. Yeah, we're going 100 kilometers an hour. Ready? Here we go. Gonna stop as hard as you can at the orange line. And Get ready, and stop. Now. That was pretty good. Oh, gosh. You saw how much extra room it took, right? Yeah, way, way more. That's why you have to leave enough room between you and the car in front of you on the highway. If you don't leave a big enough gap between the car in front of you, mm -hmm. you don't have time to react, you're gonna have an accident and you're gonna plow right into the back of that guy in front of you. Right, so the more speed you have, the more room you need between the vehicle in front of you. Absolutely. Another way cars lose control is by going too fast around a corner. Hog is gonna show me how to turn corners safely. This test is called the slalom. You always think ahead. What's gonna happen is I'm going to go around a corner. Am I going the right speed to go into the corner? Yeah. What's gonna happen if I have to do some braking to avoid a kid that's in the street? Right. Uh, playing, chasing a ball or something like that. We're ready to do the slalom. <laughs> and we're gonna do an emergency braking at the end of the slalom again. And here we go. Left, there we go. Right, right left, right. Right, am I doing good? Yep, doing great. Right. Feed the gas, feed the gas, and feed the gas. Break. Turn, break, hard, break, hard, turn. turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hagen, thanks for teaching me how to corner. I'll be back in time to race that cheetah. So, I found out that crashes are caused by bad road conditions, going too fast and not paying attention. Let's try out those conditions on a couple of cars and see if we can make them crash for real. My great challenge! Today, my challengers are Farah, who's driving the car with the blue stripes, and also Andrew, who's got the one with the red stripes. Your challenge is to drive five laps around my race course. Does that sound easy enough? It might not be, because I have a bunch of obstacles set up for you, like these dinosaurs. Every time you hit one, it'll be three seconds added to your final time, which is not good, because whoever does it in the least amount of time will be the winner. The challengers don't know that I have a few surprises in store for them that might cause a crash if they're not careful. Are you ready to race? Yeah! Okay, three, two, one, go! Farah, you went a bit too fast and already hit a dinosaur. That puts Andrew in the lead. <laughs> Farah's found my first surprise, artificial snow. So slippery. <laughs> Duh. Finally. Andrew's already done one lap. Now for my next surprise, some annoying distractions. Oh yeah, turn right there, yeah, right, no, the other way. Right there, turn, yeah. Stop right, turning turn the other Andrew's getting his second lap. Farrah's getting her first. Farrah, do you know what the weather is today? I kind of want to go outside and race later. Oh, yeah, okay, sure, bye. You, what? Yeah? Oh, you're just going to ignore yeah. me like that? Uh, yes, no, maybe so. Farrah's having trouble on the slippery part again. Yo, yo. All these distractions, eh? Harrison, don't disturb me. Oh, yeah. This is so annoying. <sighs> Oh, that snow is really slippery, huh? Yes, yes it is. Woo Before you crash into me. Okay, I got another little distraction for you guys here. No! no so don't hit that. <coughs> don't hit the cheetah there on the skateboard. <coughs> Stupid cheetah. <coughs> Dinosaur stuck oh, on me! Sad. I'm going back. I'm stuck! No, ah. Andrew, and you're on your final lap, Andrew. Andrew's just going for speed ah, now. Yeah. Not, he doesn't even care about the obstacles. My strategy's working. <laughs> or maybe not. Andrew almost completing his final lap soon. Super oh, yes. Andrew, Yay! you're done. Keep it going, Fair. You can still win, depending on what your time is. 
Some crazy maneuvers here by Sarah. How many more laps do I have? This is your last lap. I could do this. Almost done. And you're done. Woo! All right, that's the end of the race. Now it's time to count up your final times. Okay, Ferris, so your time was three minutes and 45 seconds. But then you hit 13 objects. Adding three seconds for each, your final time is four minutes and 24 seconds. Andrew, your time was three minutes and 28 seconds, so less than Farrah's original time. But you hit 19 objects, so your final time is four minutes and 25 seconds. So Farrah's the winner by one second. Yay! So what was the hardest part about the challenge? Snow. And what do you think was the hardest? If the dinosaurs wouldn't, weren't there, it'd be a lot easier. It's easier to avoid the uh, obstacles when you're going slower. Um, but in the snow, I didn't care. <laughs> in the snow, you just went for it? <laughs> Even though you crashed a bunch? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Being distracted, bad road conditions, and driving too fast can all cause you to crash. And crashing sure makes it a lot harder to get where you're going. Thank you, Farron and Andrew, for showing me some ways that cars can crash and for being on my show. No problem. You're welcome. Thank you. Here's a question from Mateo. How does aerodynamics cut through the winds? She races cars that cut through the air. Please welcome race car driver, Amy Castell. Whoa, not only a car that can cut through the air, but it doesn't have to take the stairs. Hey, Amy, I'm glad you can make it. Hey, Harrison. Can you take me for a ride in your car? It's only got one seat, but why don't you have a seat in it? Sure. I have a video of you racing in this car. How'd you get involved with the racing? Well, my family's always been interested in racing, so a few years ago we started go-kart racing, and one thing led to another, and now we're racing F1600. <laughs> nice. What is it like to be in a race? Like, what does it feel like? It's so much fun, pure adrenaline. When you're getting ready for the race, you're kind of getting your mind in the zone, as we always get nervous before a race, but your jitters kind of go away as soon as you're behind the steering wheel. And as soon as that green flag flies, you're pedal to the metal and you're going really fast. Race car drivers like Amy not only have to drive well, they have to know everything about how their car works. Mateo is asking, how do aerodynamics work? Well, just like if you were in a car and you put your hand out the window, you put your hand up like this and the wind would push it back. But if you put your hand flat, the air would go around it. Right, because it flows smoothly over your hand. It does. Mateo, Amy told me that when a car is moving, it has to push the air in front of it out of the way. When a hand or a car, like the one on top, has less air pushing against, it can go faster. I found out that the car makers use a wind tunnel and smoke to design a car that can cut through the air easily. Because aerodynamic cars don't burn as much gas, that's good for the environment. So it's the same kind of thing with these cars. We've got a pointy nose, so only a little bit is touching the air, and then the air comes up and over your head and down towards the back. Kind of cuts through too? It cuts right through. I've seen races where cars follow each other really, really closely. I heard that's called drafting. What's that all about? Drafting's when the car behind goes really close to the car that's in front of it because the car in front of it is making a big hole in the air. The car in front pushes air out of the way, so the driver behind needs less power to keep up. Then, when she's ready, she can use the power she's been saving to zoom ahead of the car in front. It's kind of like a slingshot. What is it like to be following a car really close and you're in that slingshot and you pass it? You feel like you're going way faster than you've ever gone before and all of a sudden you're right up next to their car making the pass. Well, thanks for the tips because I have a really big race coming up with a cheetah. A cheetah? Yeah. Now here's another question. How do cars work? Well, I can answer that. Harrison, why don't you get out and help me take the car apart? Sure. Well, this is the engine, and this is where you get all the power that moves the car. And then back here, we've got kind of like big springs. They're called the suspension. So the suspension smooths out the bumps in the road, so the people in the car don't feel them as much, right? Yeah. And what if you didn't have any springs or suspension to help you? You'd get really shaken apart. <laughs> and then over here, you've got your steering wheel, right. which is what turns the car for you. And then you've got your brake pedal and your gas pedal, but I mostly use the gas. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks for helping me find stuff out. Good luck against your cheetah. 
Casey had another car question. How does gasoline fuel engines? Well, Casey, to find out more, I made this animation. Air it, gas. Get pulled in. And then they get squashed. And the fun begins. The spark up here makes them go fast. Turns the crankshaft and makes it spin. Drive around your town. See ya! Here's a question from Luca. Do you fire powered engines exist? Well, Luca, I couldn't find an engine that runs specifically on, you know. First of all, I'm not sure how exactly you'd get them into the engine. Fill her up! But actually, your question isn't as silly as it sounds. I found out that farts have two gases in them, hydrogen and methane. And just like gasoline, those gases can be set on fire inside an engine to make an explosion to power a car. And guess what? There really are engines that run on both of those gases. This is a Volkswagen Beetle that runs on human poop that's been converted to methane gas and stored in these tanks. Just like the methane gas in. And this car runs on hydrogen. Also a gas that's found in. Cars have been powered by all sorts of fuels. Wood, natural gas, garbage, old French fry oil, and alcohol made from plants like corn. Now here's a question from Trey. What will the cars look like in the future? The flat earth corner. What will cars of the future look like, you ask? Why, they'll be futuristic, of course. They'll look just like a jet, and they'll be able to go as fast as a jet, and they'll be able to do backflips anytime you want, and you'll be able to do so many things with this car, and you'll have a jet-powered engine in it. In fact, you could have your own car with your very own nuclear reactor engine. Why settle for a radio in your car when you can be radioactive? Back when your grandparents were kids, that's what they thought cars of today would look like. The cars they had back then were big, heavy, clunky things that were designed to be replaced every few years. They burned a lot of gas and made a lot of pollution. Today, most people want cars that are environmentally friendly. Cars in the future will be safer and use less gas. They'll have sensors and computers that will stop our cars before we have accidents. And we might even have sun-powered cars that don't make any pollution at all. What would you want the cars of the future to be like? Let's get some. I'm here to find out if you could invent any type of car, what would it look like? It would be a limousine semi-truck. It has all the qualities of a limousine, but it's bigger and it can carry more passengers and go to places faster. I would invent a car that powers my house and it'll fold up in my pocket. It would be an amphibious car with leather seats and it would have a cloaking device which would make it invisible. It would be able to fly, and when it was in the air, it could poop up tomatoes. <laughs> My car would have a gymnasium in it. It would be blue, and it could go underwater and turn into a submarine, and it could also turn into a plane. Wow, those are all great ideas. Who knows? Maybe some of those will be the cars of the future. Speaking about the future, here's a question from Adriano. Why don't we have flying cars yet? Guess what, Adriano? There actually are flying cars. The Curtis Autoplane was built almost 100 years ago, but it only made a few short hops and never worked right. Modern flying cars are easier to use, but still have problems to work out before we can fly to school. Like, where are we gonna find all those air traffic controllers if everyone has a flying car? The skies are already busy with airplanes. But some people aren't interested in flying cars anyway. Here's a question from Dahlia. Can cars turn into submarine and swim with the fish? Well, Dahlia, until very, very recently, the answer would have been no. But now the answer is this is the scuba. It can drive on a highway and go straight into the water, like this. But just like those flying cars, this one isn't all that convenient. When it's in the water, this car is slower than a submarine or a fish. 
And you'd better bring a change of clothing, because you're definitely gonna get wet driving underwater. For now, if you want to drive with the fishes, you'll have to stay on top of the water in one of these. A water car. So cars can be airplanes, or they can be submarines. But what about this? Can a car be a rocket? Well, Youssef, as incredible as it sounds, yes. In 1970, a rocket-powered car called the Blue Flame set a new land speed record when it went over 1,000 kilometers per hour. That's faster than a jet plane. But the fastest car of all is the jet-powered thrust SSC. It can reach speeds of 1,200 kilometers per hour. And soon, its big brother, the Bloodhound, will be even faster. And that leads me back to the question that started me down this road. Is a Ferrari faster than a cheetah? No. Well, Haley, the big answer is... Actually, I have to go back to the racetrack to answer this one. Will the Ferrari beat the cheetah? Let's find out. Let's go. <laughs> Take that cheetah. Let it rip. Whoa. Three, two, one, go. For the first few seconds of the race, the cheetah is actually ahead. That's because it's lighter and can get moving faster. But the cheetah's top speed is 120 kilometers per hour. This Ferrari can go over 200 kilometers per hour. And the cheetah, like a human, soon runs out of energy when running at top speed. But a car can go fast for as long as there's gas in the tank. <laughs> oh, this is crazy! Oh, yeah! We won! Oh, yeah, one last question. What? Can I drive again? Nope. <laughs> that was so cool. I can't wait to drive my own car. But for now, I guess I'll have to settle for a skateboard. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Wanna make it two out of three? <laughs> No way. Uh.